So very good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining in for this very unique uh, webinar that we're having today on how to actually influence patients and uh, influence uh, IVF doctors and win IVF patients. Now, before we begin, um, I think last year on the same day, uh, Ashish ji, we conducted a series on mindset to success. And I mean, that was so unique because nobody really talks about it. And I think on embryology day, instead of touching upon uh, top clinical topics or embryological topics, it's more about touching the mindset. It's more about influencing basically how we work, trying to help maximum uh, embryologists on um, by giving them tips on how to improve their branding and their success. I think this is the topic that we're going to touch today. I mean, how do you come up with these ideas? And I mean, what was the rationale behind choosing such a topic for today? Yeah, thank you very much, Kesho, for uh, you know this uh, coming and moderating this session. And good morning to all friends and colleagues there. We have often seen that uh, in number of conferences, webinars, seminars, all all the time the clinical topics are you know discussed, debated, evaluated, researched. But often the men behind the machine, who are the IVF professional of our industry, that is embryologists, clinician, paramedics. And everybody who works, they are often, you know, not been focused. And it is so important that their mindset or their approach or their strategic mind has been, you know, should be updated or they should be motivated. And that's why Shivani thought that mindset for success or the people who are behind this process should be, you know, communicated and trying to bring the, you know, uh, the speakers who are having a very good success and experience in this field and can enlighten our IVF professional on these aspects so that the results and the hard work they are putting in can be amplified or magnified in the time to come. Absolutely. And I mean, today's webinar, I mean, I, I was going through the program for today uh, and I think most of it is going to be centered uh, around the patient today, even though we're talking about uh, a lot of different aspects of uh, how embryologists function and how clinicians function. But ultimately it all boils down to our patients. I mean, what, what are your views on that? See, I have been, uh, you know, talking uh, personally to many IVF uh, centers when they start, when they mature and when they, you know, they become very successful. Successful not in terms of only the commercially, but also in giving uh, pregnancies, you know, satisfying patient. But in entire this, uh, you know, uh, journey and communication, we realize that the our clinicians or our embryologists or many part in the world they are, they are super focused on the success or getting the pregnancy to the patient and in this journey uh, you know often the patient is defocused it is not ignored but the focus as much as focus is on success which is not given to the patient and as you uh, are aware or everybody is aware that ivf is very unique tricky and very complex process and it is an emotional journey for a clinician, embryologist, and also for the patient. So it is a very paramount importance that, you know, the patient is equally focused so that when the results are out and when the, he knows or she knows that she has not conceived, they are not emotionally vulnerable. And the association of the clinic with the, you know, patient remains intact. So if I have to draw a very simple parallel that, uh, you know, very uh, real uh, life parallel, very, uh, you know, layman terms, that IVF is like an airline where we know that 50% passengers will be offloaded on every flight. So if we have not treated passengers in a good spirit, they will not come back to the same airline. They will go to some other airline. And we all know, patient knows, the you know, the airline knows that 50% or maybe 40%, depending on the clinic, they will be offloaded. So it is a very simple correlation. So the this webinar, we are trying to bring the success, the obsession for the success, and balance to the obsession for the patient. So if this balance is found, then you know the it is a win-win situation for the patient emotionally, patient physiologically, and also for a clinic, and they will progress further. Absolutely, and uh, you rightly mentioned it. It's an obsession for success, and all the speakers today uh, that we have are obsessed with success. And I uh, kudos to you to get all of them on board. I'll quickly introduce them. Uh, before we uh, begin the webinar. So uh, 
firstly i'm going to be moderating uh, the session today and i'm going to be taking in questions and answers uh, for all of our speakers so please put in your questions in the chat section or in the q and a and i'll be happy to uh, pitch them to all the speakers i'm dr kesha malhotra i am uh, right now the second vice chair of uh, embryology for isar i'm also the co-chair of the sig embryology for aspire and i'm the director of rainbow ivf and meta uh, our speakers today uh, are going to be Dr. Anirudh Malpani. I'm sure all of you know him really well. He's been a pioneer in the field of reproductive medicine. He's the founder director of Mal Malpani Infertility Clinic. He's pioneered several innovative techniques uh, in India and has been documented in uh, the Guinness Book of World Records as well. Started the first uh, sperm bank way back in 1990. Uh, I'm sure uh, you might have a few questions regarding banking today uh, for him. Uh, he's also He also started the first website for infertile couples, which is ivfindia.com. Launched the first app for infertile couples, which is myfertilitydiary.com and has been an angel investor for many, many startups. Uh, we're lucky to have him today and he's going to be speaking on how to be happy embryologists. I think that's a fantastic topic because in this post uh, ART uh, regulation era, I think there's so much stress that... Uh, I'm sure all of us are losing a little bit of our happiness and a little bit of our peace. And uh, probably Dr. Malpani is going to teach us how uh, to actually get that back and not worry about um, all of these different aspects that are coming in into our fraternity right now. We also have uh, Mr. Vishal Shah who will join us uh, after Dr. Malpani. And he's the CEO and co-founders of five brands. Um, again, I just had a brief word with Vishal uh, before this webinar began and I mean, it's so important to brand yourself in this era because that is what patients see. And that's what we're going to probably learn from him uh, when he talks about IVF business uh, brand management. So uh, lucky to have you uh, with us, uh, Vishal. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Vinesh uh, Ghadia who will be joining us uh, after Vishal. Uh, Vinesh, again, has a lot of professional experience uh, in uh, the ART business. And he's been on the other side in the sense that he's been in the pharmaceutical industry as well as in the administrative uh, space as well. And he's now getting into uh, the equity space for ART. So currently, uh, he's the senior partner and CEO of Black Cap uh, Equity Management, uh, which is an uh, equity management fund specifically focused towards uh, the fertility space. Uh, he's been the CEO of uh, Art Fertility Clinics, also has been senior vice president and head of uh, IVF business for Lupin. Um, again, was a founding member and uh, COO of uh, Nova as well. And Vinesh is going to be speaking uh, to us today about the IVF landscape uh, in this post-regulation uh, era. And I think there's going to be a lot to learn from him as well. And lastly, I'm sure all of you know Alpesh. Uh, Alpesh is a consultant embryologist and founder of IVF uh, London uh, in the UK. He's a highly acknowledged uh, clinical embryologist. Uh, he's been licensed by HFEA. He's got a diploma, uh, diplomat membership from the Royal College of Pathologists as well. Extensive work. Uh, he's published so many uh, books and articles. Uh, um, we've read so much of his stuff as well. He's got great understanding of embryo biopsy and uh, PGT. And right now he's on the executive committee of Alpha Scientists as well. So uh, these are our speakers for today. Fantastic topics. Uh, Alpesh will cover the journey of an embryologist from uh, being an embryologist to an entrepreneur. And again, that's going to give us so much insight because he's one of the embryologists who's gone ahead and started his own clinic and started his own venture. And that also will give us ideas of how to actually progress within our fields. So without wasting much time, let's have uh, Dr. Anirudh Malpani first. Uh, speaking uh, to us about how to be happy embryologists. Welcome, sir. Hi. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask is, "Hey, am I audible?" Yeah, <laughs> that's how all that's how all Zoom calls start. That's the post-COVID era. <laughs> yeah, and I also need to be sure that you I'm sharing my screen. I've had problems with this because I'm not sure whether it's full screen now. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's not full screen. You can go on slideshow, and uh, it should be full screen then. I should, is this better? Because I think we had some, I'm on slideshow now. Is this better? Okay, great. So, uh, you know, I think I need to emphasize the fact that the only way to have happy patients is to be a happy embryologist. And we sometimes tend to forget that. And I'm going to explain a little bit about why we forget that and what we need to do about it. The best way, of course, 
to be a happy embryologist is to make happy embryos. And you can't have happy patients until they get pregnant. And patients can't get pregnant until they have good embryos for the clinician to implant. And that's the truth, that the IVF lab is the heart of IVF treatment. This is something which all of us know, embryologists know. Unfortunately, the problem is that patients don't know. Because when you talk to patients who've been through an IVF cycle, they'll tell you the name of the doctor whom they went to, they'll tell you the name of the assistant, they'll tell you the name of the nurses, but they won't have any idea about what actually happens in the IVF lab. And this is a big problem because for some reason, it's become a well-guarded secret that no one knows what actually happens in an IVF lab. And perhaps I think that's the reason why embryologists get such little respect. And I think it's partly embryologists to blame because unless you connect with patients, unless you let patients know exactly how important the role of the embryologist is, how important the role of the IVF lab is, this situation will never change because the truth of the matter is that the embryos are poor quality. It's always the embryologist's fault. And when a patient gets pregnant, it's obviously the clinician who did such a good job. And I think this is where we need to start, that we need to be able to reach out to patients because patients today have absolutely no idea about what an embryologist is and what an embryologist does. But the truth is being an embryologist is not easy. And I think it's going to become even harder with all the new ART regulations. So, you know, in the past, you basically had to keep patients happy. You had to keep doctors happy. And now, of course, you have to keep all these government officials happy. And you know how hard that is. But the fact of the matter is there's lots of work, lots of hassle. Most of it has become paperwork these days. And when things don't go well, you have unhappy patients and you have unhappy doctors. And it's just getting progressively worse. And the fact of the matter is that given the amount of hard work embryologists put in, really the amount they get reimbursed is just not enough. And this is partly because embryologists need to stop thinking of themselves only as scientists or only as technicians who work in the lab and do what the doctor tells them. The truth of the matter is that you have to be a professional. You have to keep on learning all the time. But even that's not enough. You need to learn to manage the IVF lab because you're an integral part of the IVF clinic. And you will have juniors. You need to teach them. You need to train them. You obviously have to deal with doctors all the time, which is never easy because they're the ones who own the clinic and uh, pay the salaries. But you also need to manage your own money. You need to take care of your family members. But none of this will ever happen unless you first learn to take care of yourself. But honestly, I think this is what it's become today, that just having more hats doesn't seem to matter. I'm not saying you need to become Ravan, but definitely, you definitely need more heads. And... I think things are going to become worse because we're increasingly seeing this all the time. Is that anything goes wrong, it's always the doctor who's sued. Anything happens, especially with the new regulation, we're all going to be so vulnerable that even if you have 999 happy patients, if for whatever reason you have one unhappy patient, they can make your life miserable. And when a doctor gets sued, the clinic gets sued, so does the embryologist. And I think this is where I need to start. I think we need to stop worrying about laws and regulations and stuff like that. They will come, they will go. But I think as long as we manage to practice ethically, we'll be fine because ethics is far more important than legal standards. You need to be able to sleep well at night. You need to be able to think, yes, I did my best possible I could for my patients. The reality is it's hard to learn ethics. And the only way to do this is to find teachers and role models who are ethical themselves. And this, unfortunately, is becoming increasingly hard today. And this is one of those things which, unfortunately, no one talks about, but the entire standard of medical practice has gone completely downhill. And I think this is why one thing which embryologists need to understand, and I'm going to be talking about a series of E, embryologists need to be empathetic. You need to engage with patients directly. It's not enough just to be very skilled at doing embryo biopsies. You need to learn to be able to explain to patients what you're doing and you have to be compassionate. You know, part of the problem is because you spend the entire day in the lab, walled off under a microscope, watching what's happening, you lose contact with the human element of IVF and that's a huge danger. And honestly, if the compassion is missing, then competence can never make up for it. And I always tell all my juniors, the patient does not care how much you know until he knows how much you care.
And don't forget the reason we became embryologists, the reason we became doctors is because we like helping people. We want them to help them to complete their family. We change their lives so dramatically. It's literally a miracle every time. So how do you develop empathy? Ideally, of course, I would say, you know, you would have an empathetic clinician and you would learn from him, but that's becoming increasingly hard. A lot of times you learn bad habits from doctors. And therefore, I think every once in a year, you should watch this great movie called Munna by MBBS. Still a classic. It'll help you polish your EQ skills. And honestly, a high EQ, whether you're dealing with patients, with doctors, with regulators, with your team members, with your juniors, is far more important than anything else. This is not something which people are taught, but actually it's surprisingly easy to learn. I mean, I've given you an acronym. We all love acronyms and we all love all these fancy this things. And most of it is common sense. And the great way to learn empathy is from a child because a child to that extent is pretty powerless and helpless, but they can still wrap you around their little finger and make you do what they want because they know how to smile and butter you up. They have an open posture, you lean forward, it's very helpful to have eye contact with the patient because then that way at least the patient knows that you're focusing on them, you're talking to them. I think this again becomes an important issue because a lot of embryologists say, well, you know, I'm getting my salary. How does anything else matter to me? But actually, if you want the doctor to regard you with respect, you need to step up. The doctor needs to treat you as a business partner, not just as an employee, because the truth of the matter is the lab is a cost center because obviously a lot of the money in an IVF treatment goes on lab disposables, consumables. But the lab is a profit center because without a lab, there would be no IVF at all. And that's something which you need to bring up. You need to understand the principles. Yes, it's true that medicine is a profession, but every clinic, especially a private clinic, is also a small business. And every IVF doctor in private practice is an entrepreneur. And that's why you need to help the doctor by learning practice management skills. And this is, again, why connecting with patients is so important, because you're effectively cutting out the middleman. You don't have to give commissions or kickbacks or referrals to someone to send patients to you. And that's why online information therapy is so important. We then come back to marketing. And for a lot of senior doctors, marketing is a dirty word. We're doctors. We're professionals. This is below our dignity. We're so good. Patients will automatically come to us. That's actually not true. And it's never been true. Clinics have always marketed themselves. Of course, 50 years ago, there was no internet, so there was no question of having a website, but times have changed, patients have changed, we need to change. Traditionally, it was word of mouth marketing. What did that mean? Which means, you know, you delighted your patients, they would send more patients to you. You would give talks at rotary clubs, you would have free medical camps, which is how the community found out exactly what you're doing. And word of mouth is definitely still the best. That doesn't change, but it takes time, but it's the most worthwhile investment of your time. How do you promote your clinic? Advertising is, of course, a shortcut, but it's extremely expensive and it's not cost effective. And honestly, I actually think it ends up backfiring because you end up spending so much money on things like Google AdWords or full page ads in newspapers and the return is going to keep on constantly going down. I think this is the secret today is that you need to go to where your patients are. And the reality is that all your patients are online today because Unfortunately, or otherwise, patients don't trust doctors anymore. They trust other patients. They trust Dr. Google. They trust the website. And that's why you need to be there. And this is such a huge opportunity, especially for young embryologists. There is tons of information available on IVF today, but most of it is in English. We need people like you to create local language, whether it's Tamil, Telugu, Marathi websites, which educate patients and educate doctors as well about the role of the IVF lab and what can do, because the reality is a lot of young junior gynecologists who will start IVF clinics have no exposure to IVF, so they don't know what's happening in the IVF lab and they can't support you. And you should create your own personal brand because it actually acts like a magnet. Your brand is what people think about you when you're not physically present. And if you create that website, and there's very little competition for local language websites today, so it's a huge opportunity you will become the trusted source. Remember, patients don't trust Dr. Google. There's just too much rubbish on too many websites, but they trust you. And if you're willing to provide reliable information, then you will become the source which people will trust. And the simple thing to do, just something which anyone can do today, is start a YouTube channel. Don't expect magical results. It'll take at least six months and you need to do this consistently. 
But the good news is it's free. The more often you do it, the better you will become. Quality is directly proportional to quantity. And right now it's completely blue ocean or virgin territory. So this is something you should explore. It's not enough, of course, just to educate patients. You need to educate yourself. And the reality is medical knowledge has a very short half-life. And like we keep on telling doctors, when you graduate, half of what we taught you was wrong. But the trouble is we don't know which half. And this is why embryologists like doctors need to become lifelong, independent, self-directed adult learners so you can remain up to date. Now, I understand books are expensive. They get outdated. Old editions are unreliable anymore. So these are two things. And if nothing else, I think perhaps this is the most important slide. The world's largest ebook library is onelib.in. And if you don't know this, please explore this. Yes, I understand these are all pirated books. People have issues about intellectual property and rights. That's a long discussion. But you'll get practically every IVF book, every scientific book, every medical book you want on this particular site, and you can download it for free. And this is such a valuable site. And I really admire this lady who's put up all medical journals, scientific journal articles, full text online for free. And this is such a valuable resource. So you can keep updated and even better, you can download these articles and share them with your doctor. You can share them with patients and your doctor will respect you and he knows how well read and well informed you are. So as I keep on saying, please educate your patients. This is what I call prescribing information therapy. And this is something we've been doing for many years. So for example, on our website at drmalpani.com, we have an IVF comic book. And patients aren't very willing to read books but they don't mind reading comic books. So it's not enough to complain that patients don't want to educate themselves. It's up to us to be able to create educational material so they're happy to learn for themselves. At the end of the day, you need to become a trusted professional, but you need to earn that trust. Patients aren't going to give it away anymore because there's so much competition. They have so much choice. And this is such a valuable equation we need to remember. Trust is needs to be earned and it's a question of credibility, reliability, intimacy. What does that mean? Credible is can the patient trust what you say and the reality is patients will counter check everything you tell them. They'll go to Google and see is what you're saying right, wrong, is it something different? You Are you reliable? If you tell a patient, hey, I'm going to call you tomorrow and show you what your embryos look like, will you actually do that or not? Intimacy, again, depends on are you empathetic? Does he know that he un you understand their feelings and what they're going through? And the denominator is self-orientation, which means are you doing this just in order to earn more money or are you doing it because you care about patients and want to help them? As I keep on saying, play to your strengths. You have a lot of them as young embryologists, far more than I do. You have a professional education, which is up to date. You have a lot of energy. You have a lot of resilience. You can bounce back because you have your whole life ahead of you. You can be agile. And India's economy is booming. I mean, you know, obviously our population is huge. The larger the population, the more the number of infertile couples. And it has become a land of opportunity. There are lots of things you can do. You obviously need to learn to sell. And selling is not a bad word. We're selling all the time, either to your wife or to your kids, why they need to do their homework or why you want to buy a new car. Learn to read. There's no excuse. I think what's the difference between a literate person and an illiterate person? The ability to absorb information by being able to read. And if you're literate and you refuse to read, you might as well be illiterate. I think learning to write, and that's the advantage of having your own website, your own YouTube channel on social media, that you can share your information. That's how you create a digital brand. And you can't do everything yourself, and you shouldn't even want to do everything yourself. Build a team. The better your juniors, the easier it is for you to promote yourself. And finally, this is the stoic philosophy or the Bhagavad Gita. Only focus on what you can control. Forget about the rest of the world. Forget about the government, the ART Act, laws, everything else. You know, all this stuff will come and go. There is a lot of joy in being an embryologist. And I think sometimes the stress which we deal with, we tend to forget the big picture. Care for your patients. Treat them all like VIPs. And I always tell embryologists, please provide photos of embryos. You've taken so much time and love and attention and effort in order to create those embryos. Give them photos. This is great documentation that you provided the best possible medical care. It increases the patient's confidence. It shows off what a good embryologist you are. There's documentation they can share with the rest of the world. And you can tell them, hey, here's your embryo. Start your baby album from today. 
And when a patient thanks you for helping them to get pregnant, please relish that moment. This is the real reward. You know, the financial income is much better if you're a share broker or a banker or a CEO or whatever else. But the emotional income of being an embryologist is excellent. And this is something we need to focus on rather than keep on comparing, Are I'm still driving just a Maruti. This guy has a Mercedes. Take advantage of that positive feedback which your patients lavish on you when you help them to have a baby. The golden rule is simple. Patients are the practice. Everything else is just paperwork. But unfortunately, as I keep on emphasizing, life is getting harder. I'm not going to say no. So you need to learn to take care of yourself. And if you're happy, you'll be able to keep everyone else happy. You need to balance your professional personal priorities. You need to have a strong support system, other embryologists you can talk to. And at some point, once you start doing something and it gets boring because it's routine, give it to a junior and move on and challenge yourself. There's so many challenges in today's world. This is a problem. And especially when things don't go well, the doctor is always happy to send the patient to the embryologist. Okay, now you explain what went wrong. But you need to be able to explain. You can't abandon them in their time of need. And of course, patients have a right to be angry and they're not being difficult. They don't want to trouble you, but they are upset. You need to acknowledge that. You need to learn to talk to relatives. And it's important to be able to network with other embryologists and doctors. You have to have a high EQ in order to become a scientist, to become an embryologist, but it's not enough. You need a high EQ as well. And the good news is these skills can be learned. You're smart. And for example, we've written this book called Successful Medical Practice. It says winning strategies for doctors, but could very easily be winning strategies for embryologists. And the good news is the entire book, all of them, whether it's for patients, doctors, whoever else, is all available free on this website, which is thebestmedicalcare.com. We'd encourage you. It's a free resource. The more you help your patients, the happier your patients are going to be and the happier you're going to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Malpani, for that fantastic talk. I think there's so much to learn from, uh, from you, uh, exactly, because... I mean, you were the first one who actually went and explored the digital space in our uh, fraternity and utilized it so well using your blogs. I mean, I've also read uh, and learned so much from it. And I think uh, the tips that you've given, especially reading uh, a book a, a week, I mean, it's, it's, a little, it's a little difficult to read a book a week, but at least we can try to read a book a month. Working in teams. The, the secret is not to read the book slavishly. It's not homework. You don't have to start from page yeah. to page. This thing, and no one's gonna. You read what you want. Skim through the book. If you already know chapter eight, two, three, four, skip those. Yeah. I think you need to learn to read actively, and that's something which, unfortunately, schools don't teach us. That's why you need to unlearn all those bad habits. But the good news is, you can learn good habits very easily. And absolutely, the second thing that I liked uh, quite a bit in your presentation was. Or uh, when you mentioned, if you get bored, give work to your juniors. And, and that's one thing probably embryologists struggle with because they're such control freaks. All of us are that we want to like do everything ourselves. I mean, I'll, I'll put this question to Alpesh as well in the panel, because we've had a discussion on this, uh, like last week itself, but I mean, it's time that we let others handle work and focus our energies on, uh, something that gives us more happiness. I mean, and that's that's the key to... But you know, when uh, your juniors shine, you obviously get so much reflected glory. And the absolutely. more you allow them to do, you know, as they rise, you automatically rise. I mean, so I, 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 think it's, I think it's time to say, okay, you know, I had my day in the sun. It was great fun. Now I need to give someone else a chance. Absolutely. So thank you so much. We will jo join you. Uh, I mean, you'll join again for questions uh, at the end of uh, the session. Yes. Um, so with this... Um, Thank you. Uh, and uh, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, Vishal again. Now, Vishal, um, I think as embryologists, most of us struggle with uh, like coming out, talking to patients, creating an image for ourselves because we, we are always working uh, in the shadow of a clinician. But times are changing and so are we. And I think your talk today on IVF brand business management, I mean, uh, is going to focus on how to build a brand for yourself. And like you mentioned in your comment in the chat, a few minutes ago, all of us are brands uh, amongst ourselves. And I'm sure you're going to touch upon all of these topics today. So uh, a very warm welcome to you and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, again, starting with the standard question, is my screen visible? Am I audible? Uh, okay. 
Kesho, all visible. Eh? I'm just we're just waiting for it to be full screen. It's full screen now. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, thanks, Kesha, and those were some amazing uh, words of wisdom from Dr. Malpani. Uh, I'm not an embryologist. I'm not from the medical fraternity, but uh, a lot of what he said, uh, specifically about the empathy and uh, basking in the gratitude, glory, thanks of the patients, is something which any of us can uh, carry. Uh, I do, so my topic is uh, IVF business brand management. I one question that might pop up in your mind is why is the flat or uh, tummy female doing in an IVF world? Uh, it's just that we are so used to seeing uh, the pregnancy bump in all our marketing collaterals. I thought this might be a little bit of uh, a difference and a welcome relief from the usual visual uh, imagery that we are seeing. The topic of today is IVF business brand management. And uh, before I jump into further, what we need to understand uh, and decode these particular topics. So the first is IVF business. So when we talk about IVF business, guys, we are talking about the business of IVF. It includes anyone and everyone in this particular fraternity, be it the uh, embryologist, be it the doctors, be it the individual professional, be it the clinics, standalone clinics, be it the chain of clinics, be it excellent centers of IVF centers within institutions or within hospitals. It covers everyone. Then let's delve upon management, a fairly simple word, uh, not difficult to understand the act or art of managing the conducting or supervising of something. Now, when it comes to brand management, specifically the word brand branding and the brand management, we need to understand what a brand is. And uh, uh, this requires a little bit of uh, delving into before we actually go into the concept of brand management. So over the next couple of minutes, we'll understand a modern definition of brand and the five disciplines of brand management. So if you're ready, just type a one or yes or whatever in the chat box. So I know that uh, we are okay to move ahead. Great. So uh, going further, let's start by dispelling some myths. There are tons of myths around branding, but there are top three myths which needs to be addressed from the current context of branding that we are experiencing in the disruptive world of today. So the first is how many of you think that your logo is your brand? If you, if you are in that space, if you're in that mental space where you think your logo is your brand, uh, uh, you're not alone. I come across many, many doctors, many, many entrepreneurs, many, many business people who consider that, you know what, my logo is there and that's a brand. My branding is taken care of. The fact is that a brand is not a logo. It is at most a symbolic representation of your uh, your logo is a symbolic representation of your brand. So uh, the swoosh uh, uh, is, is a logo, but it is not a brand. It is a representation of the brand Nike, right? The second misconception that people have is that a brand is an identity manual. Okay, so identity manuals where uh, uh, define and describe how a brand needs to be, uh, how the logo needs to be used, or the right cases, the wrong cases, in which uh, uh, typefaces it needs to be used, in which substrates, how it will be uh, used upon. So that's uh, uh, the misconception people have is that a brand is an identity manual, whereas it is not your identity manual evolved in the era of print, wherein at which point of time, the print technologies were not that great and you needed these guidebooks, you needed these identity manuals to define the, uh, the, the usage of the logo so that the brand is not diluted across uh, uh, platforms. But over years, now we come into from print, we move to television, to multimedia, to uh, mobiles, now we'll go into metaverse. So everything has become so fluid, identifying and deciding and restricting the brand in specific confines becomes very difficult and challenging. So let's clear it that your brand is not an identity manual. And there are many, many people amongst us who think that a brand is a product. You know, it's like uh, uh, there are brands, uh, there are companies which identify themselves with the products that they have come up with uh, or the product line that they have come up with. Again, not a fact. Uh, a brand is not a product. Uh, your product, if, if your brand becomes your product or your product becomes a brand, right, then it becomes challenging because you cannot extend your uh, offerings in anything else because you get identified just as a, a XYZ product company. So a brand is not a product. Uh, so what exactly is a brand? Okay. Now to uh, uh, 
jump into what exactly is a brand. Let me tell you this study, which was conducted in 2004 between Pepsi and Coke. Uh, so uh, the test subjects were uh, given the Pepsi and the Coke for sampling. So there is this blind taste challenge, which has been going on for years, started by Pepsi uh, to dethrone Coke. Uh, so this blind taste challenge, challenge was done in this particular study and uh, the participants, the volunteers were given uh, both the beverages, but without the labels. So the volunteer did not know what they were drinking, whether it was a Coke or a Pepsi. And after taking a sip or however many sips, they were asked which was the preferred drink, right? Uh, at the same time, whenever they had a sip, their, uh, their brain was scanned to see which part of the brain lit up. And it was noticed that 50, more than 50, just about 50 percent of the people preferred Pepsi over Coke, right? Uh, uh, now, a little variation was done in the uh, study and the volunteers were given both the drinks again, but this time around with labels. So people knew that they were drinking a Coke or they were sipping a Pepsi. <clears throat> now, what happened was that uh, this time around when they drank, 75 percent of the audience went tired with Coke. But the more surprising part was, the more surprising part was that in both the scans, when the blind test was done and when the label test was done, in both the uh, tests, the part of the brain which got lit up was the part which, talk, which, which, which controls your memory, uh, which controls your emotions, right? And it just goes on to say that how Coke, just by the mere label, mere presence of that particular brand or the knowledge that, oh, I'm having a Coke, how that emotion part of you or yours lit, lit, lits up. And that's where branding resides. So brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service or organization, right? And it's a person's gut feeling because individuals define brands. Let's make it very clear. It's not the companies. It's not the agencies. It's not the market. It's not the public. It is the individuals who define the brand. When I say individuals, it's the consumers, the people who are availing of your service, people who are drinking your product, people who are consuming your products. They are the ones who define the brands. It's a gut feeling. Why? Because we are emotional beings at the end of it. We are emotional, intuitive beings. We take decisions from the heart most of the time through our lives. However logical or reasoning people might be, however uh, uh, left brain or right brain we might be, at the end of the day, most of our decisions, in most of the cases, emerge out of feelings, emerge out of emotions uh, that we have, right? So it's not what you say it is. Your brand is never what you say it is. It is always what they say it is. And when I say they, I mean your customers, your consumers, your, your patients, your clients. They are the ones who define what your brand is. Uh, a very interesting uh, uh, anecdote which Ashish Bhai shared with us. So when we did the branding for uh, Shivani Scientific, the tagline that we gave was co-creating IVF success. And uh, in one of the uh, uh, international visits where he was felicitated for the contribution he had done, the, uh, the head chair or the main person in the uh, while giving that told him that, you know what, it's like together us and Shivani have create, co-created IVF success. Now, that is something which somebody else has said about you. At best, as a, as a brand, as an individual, you can plant the thought in the opposite person's mind. You can direct them. You can way of thinking. But it is ultimately they have to say that, yes, you know what? This company is all about co-creating IVF success. So why is branding critical to growing your business? Like, why is it so important? And what is it that... It's become critical, like years back, a pager was not important, then pager became important, mobile became important, websites became important. Now branding is important to your business. Why is it so? So the first reason is way too many choices, way too little time. You do a simple search of IVF doctors near me and you will get like 10 pages of results which are seen right now. So hundreds of results pertaining to IVF doctors near me. Now, when you look at it from a point of view of a patient, when you look at it from the point of view of a couple, right? For them, it's very difficult. It's very uh, uh, time consuming to go through everything. So they are going to go through the first couple of results. They are going to get the impression. They are going to make the impression on what you are projecting yourself in the online space. And then based on that, they are going to take a decision of going ahead. Now, even if you're an embryologist, even if you, uh, uh, at the end of the day, they are not searching by embryologists, for example, but they are searching for IVF clinics. They interact with you. They know about you. And 
people would definitely go online and just google you up they will see what's there available about you right and that's where branding comes into picture the second is most offerings have similar quality and features let's face it we have moved away from an era of feature comparison uh, uh, even now when you go and uh, uh, buy electronic gadgets you buy other products there is the feature comparison or the uh, parameters are at best just to do a apple to apple comparison it's not the decision making factor at all right so now what do you look at like you look at the other softer questions like what does the procedure look like where is it available what kind of people avail it which tribe will i be joining it if i buy it what does the cost say about its desirability what are other people saying about it who is offering it right so you go through all these questions all this uh, uh, thought processes and to to arrive at answers you will ask around you will go to uh, uh, go online you will hook, look up people so we'll look at all this stuff to arrive at your decision making and finally we after doing all those things we tend to base our buying choices on trust we pick up somebody based on trust we 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 feel confident about interacting with someone interacting with a professional based on the trust right so the degree of trust that i feel towards a product or a service or an individual rather than the assessments of their capabilities of or, or the features and benefits of the product will determine my buying decision and trust becomes parameter in this entire equation and it comes from meeting and beating customer expectations on a regular basis right so you're reliable you delight the customer and that leads to the trust that the customer or the patient has in you now how does branding evolve in this whole space how does it happen right now there are two ways in which it happens so the first is the the inorganic way uh, or the organic ways we call it right so you are a professional you are doing and managing multiple uh, uh, activities like dr mal pani said the government statutory compliances the technical processes the operations the compliances sales marketing finance accounts so there are multiple activities you are handling and along the way somebody comes and says oh yeah you know what you need to participate in the exhibition so we'll call up your design agency ask them to do some work somebody says that can you send me up your presentation uh, i want to look up on you you will send them a document designed by somebody else right so what happens is that more most of the companies most of us brand happens while we are doing something else our focus is not on the branding activity our focus is on the other aspects of our professional life of our business life and along the way by the way the brand happens so it is not a focused activity and that's where uh, uh, after a certain point you start realizing that you know what the brand that i'm projecting of myself is not uh, congruent to what i am or what i stand for and that's when you you start the process of isolating the brand from your other endeavors so you you start saying that you know what i need to focus my time 2 uh, hours a week 4 hours a week 8 uh, one day a week on developing my brand uh, uh, or one one day a month on developing my brand and you start to study it you start to manage it you start to influence it you start to measure it right and from a brand that just happens by chance you you would rather co actively like very very uh, 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 in a active way you go into creating your brand in cases of companies or in cases of ivf clinics you will see a lot of people uh, employing brand managers a lot of people employing corporate communications had to to do this now even after doing this uh, 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 at the end of it you realize that your brand is a combination of creativity and strategy creativity alone cannot create a brand strategy alone cannot create a brand it takes creativity and strategy to create and manage a brand so again because it's a left and right brain the challenge becomes that even after doing this the problem happens is that you are not successful the reason why you're not successful is that your left brain does not know what the right brain is doing and this is very critical which means that your creative team or the creative part of your uh, uh, handling of your brand is disconnected from the strategic part of handling your brand and this is the critical thing which leads to a uh, 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 a successful brand management so your brand management is all about bringing your strategy and your creativity together to achieve your business objective right uh, so now when i'm talking about branding and the disciplines of brand management i'm talking both business branding as well as personal branding so this apply to professionals as well as to businesses uh, equally right now there are five core disciplines of brand management differentiate innovate collaborate 
cultivate and supervise. All of these five are equally important. One cannot be lesser or bigger than the other. All of them are equally important. However, because of a certain time restriction and the amount of time that I'm given, I'll be focusing more into a few of them and I'll be just brushing through the others. So the first is differentiate, right? Now, the fact is that our brain acts, there's so much of information that is bombarded to us that as a, as a, as a protection mechanism, our brain acts as filter uh, to the information overload which is there. Now, what does this mean? It means that as a as a as as, a, as a human beings, we are hardwired to notice only what's different, right? If our brand, if your brand is run of the mill, if is your brand is something which the other next competitor of yours is similar to, right? You are not going to be noticed because the brain will refuse to see this. So this brings us to the three most important words in differentiating your brand. And if you have a piece of pen and paper, if you have any recording device, I would want you to note down these three words. These are the, even if, if this is the single most takeaway that you can uh, uh, have from this particular uh, uh, session, right? So the first word is focus. When we talk focus, we are talking about the focus of your brand. Where is your brand focus? Focus on your target audience, focus on what you're offering, focus on what you stand for, focus on what is the benefit that your customers get when they, when they select you, uh, when they interact with you, focus on uh, uh, the geography that you are targeting to, focus on the people uh, and the demographics of the people that you are focusing on, right? So focus is the most critical element of uh, uh, your brand differentiation. The second word is again focus because Without focus, it is impossible to differentiate the brand. And the third word, yes, you guessed it, is also focus. Now, here's a small test which I would like you to do, right? Uh, okay, just a second. Yeah, here's a small test which I would like you to do. Uh, whenever you have time, isolate yourself from the rest of the crowd, from your business. Take a 10-minute, 15-minute break, switch off your phone cup of coffee or a tea, whatever uh, rocks your world and answer these three questions. Who are you? What you do? And why does it matter? Right? They appear extremely simple, but trust me as a, as a strategic brand communication agency, I do this exercise with, with all my clients and every time, and I'm not surprised that they end up struggling with this, answering these questions with clarity. So if you get your who, what, and why of your business, it's great. The who is very simple. The what it's, it's again simple, but when it comes to the why does it matter, that's where people start stumbling because the why has to, has to tie in with the who and the what of it and it has to make complete sense to all the stakeholders of your brand, right? And you want to make this more interesting. Uh, uh, what we do during our brand uh, uh, exercises is we, we, we have all the stakeholders of the organization uh, 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 to fill this up. In case of embryologist, you can ask your peers, you can ask your uh, 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 physicians or clinicians uh, to do this for you. Like, what? who are you? What, what do you stand for? What does it matter? What do you do, right? Uh, why does it matter? And the responses that come in, if they are not aligned, right? It just means that your brand needs more uh, uh, fine tuning to be done. Your brand needs more clarity. Your brand needs a more specific differentiation to be done. Uh, the second is innovate. So with the differentiation part, you can, you, the moment you differentiate yourself, that becomes the fulcrum on which your entire communication strategy rests, right? So if you, if you, if you define yourself as co-creating IVF success, uh, uh, everything starts working around it. So you talk about success mindset series, you talk about generating testimonials from the leaders within the industry. So all your communication strategy works on that fulcrum of the differentiation that you have created. Now, however great your communication strategy is, right? It is always the creativity that gives brand their traction in the marketplace. If that strategy is not projected in a great way, in a, in a, in, in a way which registers, in a way that takes the attention of the people who are looking into it, right? It's not going to matter. So it's the execution and not the strategy is where the rubber meets the road. So creative uh, has to be great. The third is a collaborate. <clears throat> now, again, uh, I think so. Uh, Dr. Malpani also stressed on this, that build a team for yourself, right? Uh, and that's the truth. 
you cannot create a brand in isolation. You cannot create a brand just on your own. You cannot create a brand just with a single agency. You have to collaborate to create a brand. Take again the example of Shivani. They have got four uh, uh, professionals or subject matter experts uh, uh, to, to, to participate in this, to offer something of value to the audience which is present right now right now this is nothing else but this is collaboration to create the brand of shivani and the individuals themselves are also benefited in the process right so it takes a village to build a brand and as long as we remember it as long as we are open to the concept of collaboration as long as we are uh, open to the concept of co-creation this is great industries and industries have worked successfully in this format the best is the filmmaking industry. Different professionals come together uh, uh, and create a majestic piece of art uh, for you to en enjoy, to, for you to be entertained. So it is not something a different concept. We have been seeing it and observing it since the ages and we have seen it being successfully done, right? The next is a cultivate part of it. Now, once the brand is created, you've collaborated, you've interacted, you, you, you have differentiated yourself. Now comes the process of cultivating it. And if you think that business is an entity and not a process, cultivation is not going to be possible. So you have to be of the mindset that business is a process and not an entity. Because the moment you make your business as an entity, the moment you make your profession as an entity, that becomes outside of you, right? It's not within you. It becomes outside of you. But the moment you make it a process, you are part of the process, you are part of it, and that is part of you, right? So you, you every moment, every uh, possible scenario, start thinking like a brand, you start thinking like a process, uh, and you feel like, what is it that I'm doing that is going to benefit the brand? What is it that I should do? What is it that I should record? What is it that I, I should journal? What is it that I should write? What is it that I should document for this brand that I'm building off for myself? Right. So living brand is a pattern of behavior. It's not a stylish veneer. You have to consistently, consistently keep on looking at it, evaluating it and seeing it, how it can be evolved. Again, taking an example of Shivani, we have been associated with them for 20 years and through the years, Shivani as a brand is one of the most proactive brand, uh, which, which follows uh, uh, of upgrading themselves, ensures that it delivers the right differentiation and the right messaging to its audience every time. So we have moved from Shivani Scientific Enabling Life through technology to Shivani We Innovate, We Create, when they started getting patents and when they started there developing their own technologies to Shivani co-creating IVF success, right? Uh, so uh, you, you need to, and once this positioning, you keep on refining, you also need to spread it. So you, you get spread it across through various mediums, through your social media, through, through different point of contacts that you can have, but never miss out an opportunity to, uh, uh, to spread this, right? The last and the foremost, but equally important is supervise many of us, and this is a policy of thinking for most of the businesses, most of the brands, most of the entrepreneurs that I come across, is that they feel that Ekbar brand Banadia, once you have created the brand, sorted, life is done. And they would move ahead uh, with other things in life. But that's wrong. The, just the way we sit in a car after fueling it up, after uh, 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 starting the engine, it's not just that we focus on the road ahead. It's not just uh, that we focus on the goal ahead. We, we constantly get uh, uh, checking on the dials, on the parameters which are there on the dashboard. Similarly, for your brand, there are various parameters are there. Some parameters which are extremely easy, like your social media metrics, your online metrics, and other parameters which are subjective, but still are measurable, still are uh, uh, can be explored into identifying and documenting and measuring them please supervise the brand that you are creating. See the feedback that is coming into from people, uh, uh, sp uh, written feedback, spoken feedback, behind your back, if you hear something. See to it that you take that feedback, you supervise it and tweak your brand accordingly, tweak your uh, communication accordingly, tweak your position accordingly. So again, to reiterate, the five core disciplines of brand management, differentiate, innovate, collaborate, cultivate, supervise. All five of them are equally important all five of them are critical to the uh, 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 creation of the brand as well as management of the brand and nothing should be ignored at the cost of the other. Uh, so yes, here's wishing you, uh, I hope this was of value to you and you take something from this uh, uh, back home. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. It was absolutely uh, wonderful. I think when we talk about businesses, the last slide that you put out, put out all, all those five important points, 
uh, I mean, I just have one question for you here. When you like are branding a business and when you're branding yourself personally, I mean, is there a difference? And if you're in a field where, like, let's say I'm on, I'm talking about embryologists today because we are uh, celebrating World Embryology Day, which is tomorrow. If you're in a field where you're already in the background, I mean, how in that scenario do you brand yourself and, I mean, contribute to attracting patients towards the clinic as well? Okay, so one uh, 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 shift that we need to make is that it's only the business that require the branding. The professionals are brands in themselves. They are business in themselves. And your market value, uh, be it in, in the, in the, as a professional in the job market or uh, uh, otherwise, is dependent on what people see uh, and perceive about you. Gone are the days when it was just the CV that or the bio data that was the parameter on based and the interview which was based, uh, based on which we used to uh, hire people or pick up people. It is also the online brand of yours which is now contributing to the decision making uh, of selecting you. So uh, be it a, brand, a professional or a business, branding is common to uh, both of them uh, uh, and it is equally critical. Now comes to your specific question behind the scenes, right? You might be behind the scenes, but it is at critical moments where you also come in front, like how Dr. Malpani mentioned that if something goes wrong, the doctor places you in front of the uh, 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 the, uh, the doctor places you in front of the patient, right? Uh, uh, and going forward, you would interact, you would be sharing the embryo uh, uh, pictures with them. And that is where your interaction is happening. And at that point of time, uh, people would Google you up, people would search you up. And that's where you, from the background, you come to the front. And when, if people do search about you, if people do know about you, you would want to project the right uh, identity, right? So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I think the take-home message that I take from your presentation as, as a, uh, building a personal brand is that you have full control over your perception. I think whatever you put on put on the internet, whatever you put on social media is something that a lot of people will see. And, and that's something that you can easily control. So be wary of what you're putting Absolutely. on the internet. And I mean, like Dr. Malpani also said, use that platform to create content because that's what uh, patients are also looking for and that automatically builds your brand uh, as well. So uh, we'll continue this uh, when we have the discussion, but thank you so much, Vishal, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I think lots of uh, tips for all of us uh, to implement uh, once we finish this session. Now with this, uh, I'll, I'll like to welcome uh, Mr. Vinesh Gadia. I think uh, everyone knows uh, Vinesh here. I've already introduced him. But Vinesh is now stepping into a new role uh, as uh, the CEO of uh, like Black Cap Investments, which is equity management uh, for the fertility space. Uh, we had a fantastic discussion at Eshray um, a few uh, weeks ago, Vinesh. And I mean, I'm really looking forward to you speaking on this topic today, which is IVF landscape in the post-regulation era, because as a person who's now investing into the fertility space, as a person who's run multiple chains, as a person who's also been in the pharma, I mean, this regulation is scaring a lot of people. This regulation is taking a lot of peace away from us. And I mean, I really uh, think that you are the right person who will touch upon all, the, all these different aspects today and uh, hopefully um, steer a way forward for all of us. So uh, with this, uh, a very warm welcome to you and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Kesha. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, at the outset, first, uh, I would uh, wish to sincerely thanks Shivani and Mr. Ashish Modi for uh, organizing this amazing uh, event. Uh, I think uh, celebrating World Embryology Day or slash World IVF Day could not have, could not have been better than this. So thank you very much. And I also wish to thank uh, Vishal and Dr. Anirudh for setting up a very interesting scene. And I think we are amidst the mid of the program and uh, I will try to contribute best to the topic. Uh, one short dis disclaimer, uh, my topic is landscape of IVF in India post-regulation. I will first touch upon the landscape of IVF in India, a subject close to my heart. And then uh, I will carry on the discussion at the end, uh, what changes post-regulation according to me. And I come from a business administration management side and not a medical legal side, but I'll try Finish. to, sorry. Yeah, if you could, if you could just uh, do the slideshow. Yeah. Perfect. It's perfect. 
Yeah. So uh, post landscape, I will touch upon regulation post landscape, and I will I'll give what is in my view. I have followed the regulation from last ten years, so uh, I will I will try to touch upon the topic. Thank you very much. This is my favorite slide. Uh, since two thousand eight, uh, I travel to uh, international conferences speaking about IVF potential in India. And uh, I had some many funny discussions with uh, many people across the world. And I uh, I used to be optimistic even uh, early 2000, and I'm optimistic even now. So the reason why, when, whenever I used to talk about India, most people used to uh, never give importance uh, that India is 5,000 cycles, 25,000 cycles. It's still a long way to, for, for India to come onto the age. And I used to always uh, enjoy debating it and uh, focusing on something which is now very popular called demographic dividend. India sits on one of the best demographic dividend in terms of potential of IVA business. And hence, uh, today, everyone understands and accepts that we are one of the top markets of IVF in India. And now when we go and discuss about our total number of clinics, total number of cycles, most people in India, um, many would be in this audience also, would believe that we have we have arrived and we have now been close to saturation. Around 2,000 clinics, 250,000 cycles, it's too much, right? Uh, my belief is that the Indian IVF industry is now taking off, or it's just taking off. And we have a we have a golden decade in front of us, and uh, most likely, hopefully, according to me, for next two decades, we will not be close to saturation. It will keep growing robust. The reason behind, again, uh, demographic dividend. India has the highest young population in the world, higher than China. The biggest demographic dividend, which is encashed by most business, and IVF is not uh, not aloof. One of the most important aspect of IVF landscape is how many young population we have. But it is also important to understand that just having young population would not have been enough. India has one of the highest urge of parenthood. This is a published data I'm talking about. And India has one of the highest urge of parenthood, and India has the not one of the highest, but highest urge of parenthood among major economies, which also is very important for understanding the landscape and IVF potential in India. And third, not, not last, but not the least, is ever-changing lifestyle. We all know that our lifestyle is changing very fast. It has changed the most in last decade. And uh, while we blindly copy Western lifestyle, here, I want to again say I'm not being judgmental about Western and Eastern, but we have to understand that culturally we used to marry early because uh, Indian woman genetically, ethnicity-wise, peaks its potential of fertility at 25, whereas a Caucasian woman, woman peaks at 31. There is an inherited difference of six years. Again, this is a Indo-Spanish multi-clinic, multi-ethnicity uh, study published in Fertility Charity. So while it's okay to marry late in a Western culture because the peak potential of fertility is six years later, in India, culturally we, culturally, we used to marry early. Now, when we copy Western lifestyle and marry late, focus on career, all good, focus on lifestyle, all good, we cross the peak potential of fertility and hence infertility is becoming a bigger problem in India. One out of six couples in urban India one out of nine couple across India is suffering from infertility. Again, a published data. These three put together, highest young population, highest urge of parenthood, ever-changing lifestyle, focusing only on one thing, makes India one of the very, very potential country for landscape of IVF business. And we, we, can, we have a lot to contribute as a fertility industry as we help millions of couples to achieve the dream of parenthood in the coming decade. These are again a very unknown factor to all of us, lifestyle factor uh, affecting fertility in India, increasing effective age of marriage in India, which I referred just now, very high tobacco consumption compared to most countries in India, especially the smokeless tobacco, which impacts significantly on the fertility potential of men, women, both. Increasing prevalence of obesity in men and women in India also is very evident and increasing alcohol consumption in men and women, both. This is very normal. I think all, we all of us know that it, this impacts fertility potential of, uh, uh, of couples. 
Some are clinical factors, uh, increasing usage of contraceptive, high prevalence of polycystic ovarian disease in Indian ethnicity, and very high prevalence of endometrial tuberculosis in India compared to any other country. With and a some the shifting demographic trend, which I will cover in my next slide, and these racial factors in ethnicity, which is difference between Indian and Caucasian women. So put together, lifestyle factor, clinical factor, impacting infertility, infertility in India. This is a slide which I think is very important. Uh, today, uh, as per published data, which we have internal, internally, we have about 1,750 IVF clinics in India. And we are doing somewhere about 225 to 250,000 cycles. Value of the industry is about $650 million. Everybody agrees. Uh, we had a lot of lab webinars and conferences in last, uh, world, uh, last year's World Fertility or Embryology Day where we had in all webinars, all stakeholders agreed that in next five years, India will grow to almost 100% on 17-18% CAGR growth. We today add, even during pandemic, we add one IVF clinic every week. We add about 50 to 75 clinics every year. Even during pandemic, you would have seen that there were many organized chains who kept on growing, kept on uh, launching new clinics. Even with this current speed, we will be around 220, 250 IVF clinics, nearly half a million cycle. And the industry potential will rise to 100% from 650 million to about 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars. What will take off after that? This will continue growing. But one aspect which is still not uh, taken off in India is fertility preservation, which is, uh, there are some interesting conferences, debates happening on this, but it's, it's time that in the next five, six years, uh, this will also take off because the current generation uh, understanding the need of fertility education, understanding the need, uh, the lifestyle is not going to reverse. So the choice is to freeze the fertility at right time and then continue living the current lifestyle and achieve parenthood at a desired age. This will trigger or this will fuel the, the, the progressive potential of IVF in India. And it's estimated that we will have somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 IVF clinic at the turn of the decade, close to a million cycle, and about three to five billion dollars. In next five years itself, India will become the fertility treatment capital of the world, and at the end of the decade, we will be an undisputed leader in terms of uh, number of clinics, number of cycles, and also in terms of value. So this is the. Uh, uh, IVF uh, landscape, which is looking like in the coming decade in India. Uh, many of uh, us will have a question that why this robust growth is happening or will happen in the current decade. So if we go through all the evidence data, which is available today, one of the most acceptable evidence is uh, EY uh, white paper published for IVF potential in 2015. The whole uh, EY exercise was done on 2010 population census counting done by government of India and 2020 is still pending because of COVID. Based on 2010 data, based on the 2000, 2010 young population, it was concluded that we have 30 million infertile couples in India. Now, if you see how the demography has changed from the last 10 years, from 10 to 20, 178 million women in zero to 15 years of age 56 million in 15 to 19 years and 53 million into 20 to 24 years. Most of this would have shifted into reproductive age, which is, which is a very huge number. Whereas the last three bars, 42 million, 34 and 30 million, which have, would have gone out of a potential of fertility age, which we consider 25 to 49. This demographic shift of young population itself is a growth of 25%. What I'm trying to say is that if we don't do anything, but just increase the TG by 25%, and we, we know that we are, uh, we are long, long uh, away from the maturity of the market. What I mean is that the penetration of how many people require infertility treatment in India and how many come to clinic in India is a huge gap. Even if there is a few fraction of improvement in, in this uh, awareness, education, acceptability for coming forward for treatment and an increase of 24% uh, in the target audience from last decade to this decade. From 247 million couples, which was estimated by as per 2010 census, 
we are now 434 million couple in reproductive age. So the 30 million infertile couple with the same uh, yardstick is now 50 million infertile couple. It's a huge number uh, of infertile couple and it is it would be never heard by any other country in any other landscape. If you also compare one of the uh, published data, we have more number of IVF clinics than the whole Europe. This is because we have millions of couples in India who require infertile, which is significantly more than any other country or continent. To end this uh, landscape discussion, uh, this is a very simple narration for any business, uh, for any industry to succeed. What is required is three point, right market condition, right people and right capital. So as for market condition, it, it cannot be better than this decade for IVF in India. We are entering into a golden phase of uh, IVF landscape in India. And it's, it's the time where we, can, we, we should invest. Uh, it's a time where long lasting corporates should be established. It's the time when we invest and also at the end of the decade, we exit. And it's the time where we can help millions of couples to achieve their dream of parenthood. Right people, I think India has the most skilled manpower in terms of number of gynecologists in India. When we talk about this, across the world, anywhere you would have never heard that a country has more than 35,000 skilled, very capable gynecologists. Half of them or 30, 40% of them intends to become infertility specialist. Many of them, thousands of them wants to become IVA specialist. So this is, an, this is a very, very uh, potential landmark that we have enough doctors in India who wants to practice and can practice IVF by, by doing a one-year fellowship. We have a shortage of embryologists in India. And I think now there are many, many universities who are uh, starting course of MS in clinical embryologists. And I think the situation will become better. But I still believe that there are there is a room for making more universities, more courses for embryology in India. And I had this very interesting discussion with Keshav in Dr. Keshav in, in, uh, in Ashray, that it's time that there are at least five more school of embryology in India is started and we should start a world-class MS in clinical embryology in India, which will help the IVF industry. Right Capital, there are many institutional investors like ours who are eager to invest in Indian story, Indian healthcare story, and Indian IVF business as it's a sunshine sector. And in next 10 to 20 years, it's only going to uh, show a robust growth. Also, it is very important that if we take an example of uh, a country like Japan, country like South Korea, where they are facing big time crisis today of having less young population because the population was declining from last 30, 40 years. You take example of China, which is big time regretting their uh, strategy of one child in 1970. And now they are, they are pushing their population, incentivizing them to have more children. Today, it's time for India to learn from South Korea and Japan, where they are struggling big time in the economy for, for a declining population, that today, the IVF industry or the infertility sector in India has a lot to contribute, not only to help these millions of couples to achieve the dream of parenthood, this will also reduce the impact of uh, reducing fertility replacement rate in India. So after a decade or so, if we continue growing and we continue helping couples to achieve their dream of parenthood, it will also contribute uh, for India not to decline their population, which is expected as per the current trend and uh, current data, which is published. Help more uh, couples to achieve their dream. Help India get more youngsters in the coming decade, which, which will result into better workforce, which will also result into a growing economy and we continuing having our demographic development. Regarding regulation, uh, uh, my view is that uh, following this regulation from last 10 years, this ART regulation, of course, needs to evolve. There will be an evolving changes in some of the laws which are bothering to the fraternity. But over, uh, overall, the regulation will increase consumer confidence. Overall, overall, the regulation will improve standardization of practice. Overall, the regulation will improve more SOP-driven practices in India. This will improve the quality, this will improve the results. And I think this will improve sentiments overall for the industry. We will have more invest in, investment in India or going to a regulated business. And this will overall help patients and, and the industry to grow to the next level. 
So it's a welcome change. I don't see any problem in regulation. Of course, some of the laws as we implement will evolve and will get, will keep changing on this. Once it's stabilized and we are out of the learning curve in next six months to one year, and we look back, I think we will all be happy that this regulation has finally come to come to India. Market will be very regulated, will become quality conscious, and it will overall overall only ignite future growth of the industry. Thank you very much. And uh, in this era of uh, Insta Reels and YouTube sh shorts, I think I would like to keep it very short. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vinesh, uh, for that very insightful uh, talk. Uh, I mean, there are certain issues with uh, the ART bill. I, I think all of us know that. But it's really encouraging to see that uh, all of you who are investing into the space are still uh, really excited about uh, the Indian market. The projections look wonderful. And uh, I mean, it gives us all a lot of hope because, I mean, since the bill has come, uh, most of us are really questioning whether we should be running IVF centers or not, whether gynec practice was better than running an IVF clinic. But I, I, I completely agree with you uh, when you mentioned that, uh, that this law is going to evolve and uh, it is going to standardize practices. It's going to improve uh, patient care. Uh, there are few issues with it, and I'm sure those will get sorted soon. So, so uh, Kesha, I, uh, yeah, Vinesh. Sorry. My my view is that any new law uh, will pass through a curve from both the side, from the from the regulation or regulator side, and from the consumer side. And uh, I mean, I don't want to get into the issues of donors and some of the uh, critical factors which is bothering all of us. But I I am a very optimistic person. I firmly believe that industry also will go through a curve. The regulators also will go through a curve. You, I'm just giving a very funny example. You take an example of demonetization. There were 167 gadgets published in one, ten, one week, two weeks after demonetization because government realized that there were many flaws in that. <laughs> My point is that regulator <laughs> and consumers... Yeah, okay. Father is here. Papa is Papa's box. Hello? Alpesh, if you can mute yourself for just a second. So my view is that uh, the regulator and the consumer both will pass, go through a curve, the industry will go through a curve, but it looks like it will have a positive impact long lasting for the industry and for the consumer. But do, do you believe that uh, the government is prioritizing uh, uh, IVF because we know our market, I mean, we know the amount of patients that would require these services, but we also know that the country is struggling with population control. And I mean, so is this a priority? Do you guys, when you speak to uh, policymakers, when you're doing some advocacy for uh, this space, do you talk about all of this and do you try and appraise uh, the government officials that, yes, this is something that is really required? And I mean, how can organizations and how can corporate chains contribute to this? So, uh, Keshav, this is a subject very close to my, uh, my heart. And I am, I am again speaking on this. Why, why don't we learn from China? They are regretting publicly big time on their population control measures in 1970. Today, they are incentivizing, incentivizing their, their, their citizen to produce more. Why don't we learn from South Korea, where the trend, trend has gone toward being fashionable, not having children, is today impacting big time to the economy. Japan is struggling. They are working with large corporates, including uh, fertility companies like Cooper, Cooper Global, spending millions of dollars to create awareness to get marry and have children we have we are we are blessed with young population we are blessed with urge of parenthood we are blessed with a very very good culture the focus should now shift from population control to making people aware the importance of parenthood which will impact global economy which will impact our economy and it's a separate topic to discuss someday it also it impacts global happiness index Absolutely. It's so important. I believe fertility industry, not only in India, globally has so much to contribute in this. So I think uh, if we are wise, which I believe, uh, government of India, we will we have anyway stopped any uh, uh, mass campaigns on population control. It's time to do campaign of make, making people aware. It's fine if you want to choice, choose your lifestyle and marry late. It's fine, but you should understand our, our ethnicity, our genetics, and promote campaign of fertility preservation and promote campaign that if you have 
suffering from infertility, accept it as a medical disease, take right treatment at right time. Got it. So uh, I think we'll continue this discussion uh, after the last talk, which is uh, Alpesh, uh, Alpesh's. And uh, thank you so much for putting your views forward. And um, I'm looking forward to a very active discussion to follow. Uh, if you could just stop sharing. Yeah, fantastic. So now uh, the last talk for today is, uh, I think, something that I'm really looking forward to because Alpesh uh, is a friend. He's been a mentor as well. And uh, I, th I think the kind of uh, like uh, stories that he shares, the kind of, uh, I was just uh, with him. Uh, uh, like last week uh, and like how he's built the clinic how he's uh, marketing the clinic how he's uh, like turning from an embryologist to an entrepreneur on, and handling all of the business it's it's so insightful and there's so much to learn from you Alpesh I think uh, uh, this talk the journey from for an embryologist from from an embryologist to an entrepreneur uh, is going to be very insightful I'm very sure about it and we're really looking forward to hearing you it, I know it's really early for you thank you so much for joining in now we will blame uh, Shivani for it, not me. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure even at this hour, uh, your views would be of immense value to all of us. Thank you so much, Keshav. And thank you to team Shivani. Just wanted to confirm that everyone can hear. Um, and uh, yes. thank, you, thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Ashish Modi as well for the kind invitation. Uh, this subject is very close to my heart and it, of course, captures a lot of my professional journey in, in the scope and in the field of IVF. Um, everyone knows me more as an embryologist than essentially an uh, entrepreneur. And this was a turntable in my life, certainly in 2017, when uh, I kind of decided that I wanted to move to the dark side, which is more to do with owning a business. So hopefully this uh, talk gives a lot of embryologists the insight into my journey and specifically uh, that uh, it's, it's a journey certainly worth taking. It's not easy, but I think I'll talk a lot about the challenges that I've faced as an embryologist. Um, at the same time, I'm going to capture a lot of the vital business information that essentially we need to know before we embark on this journey. So I hope it is useful. So by way of an introduction, uh, I'm a consultant clinical embryologist, and this is something that I still perform to date in my lab, in our lab here. Uh, I co-founded uh, IVF London in 2017. By way of experience, I'm still a very hardcore clinical embryologist. This is where my passion is. This is where my, um, my spark attains, my, my day starts. Um, there are certain elements of the business or the clinic that I really enjoy doing, which is the lab and some elements that I don't so much enjoy, which is the management, the money management, et cetera, et cetera. But this is uh, what it is. You know, you do what you really enjoy and uh, you also do things that you don't so much enjoy. But anyway, uh, that's what, uh, that's a bit about me. I also hold a honorary consultant position at a couple of NHS establishments. So my journey uh, all started with uh, when I finished my uh, A-levels, and uh, A-levels is what we call the 18 plus exams, when I kind of decided that, okay, what do I want to do? And, um, you know, having been brought up in a small town in Kenya called Mombasa, our um, vision on a, what, will, what we call a uh, career guidance perspective was very, very limited. The typical options available from a career perspective or either pharmacy, dentistry, medicine, uh, accounting, uh, or business. And of course, having taken sciences at A-levels, um, my aspiration was to do dentistry. And um, I was so focused and geared towards wanting to do dentistry that all my work experience when I finished, um, sorry, when, when I was kind of studying for my A-levels revolved around going and visiting dentists and never realized that um, I would probably not get in. Um, and, and that was because I didn't get the grades at A-level. And look, this is a very transparent journey of mine. So I have absolutely no regret or shame in kind of sharing my journey simply because uh, I believe I am what I am because of my journey so far. So I didn't get the grades to get into dentistry. And like, um, <clears throat> like a lot, you know, there's so much competition in India as well to kind of get into medical school, dental school, 
the grades that were required were very, very high. <laughs> anyway, I then succumbed to doing a degree in biomedical sciences um, and studied from 1993 to 1997, did my uh, undergrad. I then was very fortunate enough to get a post in one of the MSCs. And at that time, there were only two establishments in the UK that were offering a MSc related to reproductive biology or reproductive medicine. So I got into Imperial College for one of these very prestigious um, courses under the leadership of Professor Robert Winston. And I got trained, uh, of course, in, in some of the uh, you know, basic fundamentals of embryology and reproductive medicine under his leadership. And um, really enjoyed my course there, my, my studies there. I then became a trainee embryologist at Churchill Clinic in 1998. And um, that was my trainee year. I spent a year um, you know, acquiring a lot of my basic andrology and embryology skills at the Churchill Clinic in 1998. And I then joined a leading clinic in London called CRGH, Center for Reproductive and Genetic Health, in 1999. And uh, I continued my uh, journey as an embryologist there. And of course, they were a clinic that was doing, at that time, around 250, 300 cycles a year. And uh, I then took over leadership of that lab in 2001. Uh, and in 2017, when I left, they were doing almost two and a half thousand cycles. So um, what made me think uh, that I wanted to kind of take a step in a different direction? And I think it all kind of created a bit of a turntable for me when I felt that a fertility clinic was becoming a bit of a factory. Uh, and of course, you know, there's nothing wrong in that. There's no, there's nothing wrong in volumization being um, very corporate, commercial, absolutely. These are the journeys that, you know, businesses do take in order of their growth spurt. Uh, but what was still very important to me is what the patients were saying to us day in, day out, which is, um, you know, what, what would they really like? And the current establishment where I was working was providing a lot of that, but was not providing a lot of that whilst they were in their growth spurt. Now, of course, individualized care is something that every patient wants, and we all understand the need for that. For a IVF couple, we all know that there is no one size fits all uh, regime in IVF, and we need to really kind of focus on our patients in order to make sure that we're giving them a very individualized journey and care. Of course, the they would have preferred to see the same doctor so that they're not kind of repeating themselves at every uh, visit. And of course, we all know that there's multiple visits in an IVF cycle. So it's very stressful for an IVF couple or an IVF patient to be explaining everything again and again and again. And it just feels very explosive as well for a couple who are going through a journey and don't necessarily want to um, remind themselves of the pain that they're going through. Some patients said it felt like very conveyor belt, you know, in a clinic where there was over 2,000, 3,000 cycles, they felt like a number. Uh, the lab was very swift. And of course, I was leading a team of about 15, 16 embryologists there at um, my previous workplace. And it was, I was very proud to say, and I often use the analogy that it felt like a Toyota factory. However, you know, a Toyota factory is a very finessed uh, automation line. You know, everything is kind of um, happening uh, very uh, regimentally, very methodically, and yet there's very little communication internally because everything is very automated. Of course, um, KPI driven, the lab was extremely KPI driven. Where I was and I, I gained a lot of those fundamentals when it comes to the quality management. We all know that as embryologists and as clinicians, one of the most challenging part is to keep the consist consistency of the output from a KPI perspective, whether that is the number of cycles that we have month on month, whether that is the number of egg collections we do, the number of eggs we collect, fertilization rate, uh, cleavage rate, blastocyst rate, pregnancy rate, clinical pregnancy rate, et cetera, et cetera. One of the most important parameters for me was my academic standing. And uh, those who know me quite well um, would know that I, thrive on a lot of academics. I'm a educator. I still have academic positions in various institutions, including University College London. 
And this is something which is my passion. One thing that has really kept me grounded in clinical embryology is um, my ability to teach um, you know, on MSc courses, workshops, etc. So I love the ability to be able to impart knowledge. I'm also, I, I love um, writing papers, uh, conducting research studies, and that's what really kind of is the, the fuel for, for or, or is my thirst. Um, of course, you know, I'm university linked as well. And as I said, I lecture as well. Now, the entrepreneurial journey, as I said, all started in 2017 when, um, you know, one of the clinicians that I worked with, and we all know that in order to start an IVF clinic, there are two key people that are needed. And of course, the whole team is uh, essential, but the two key people needed is a good embryologist and a good clinician. And like any journey, my partnership and my discussions also started with a clinician who was very keen to kind of establish uh, a very unique model of an IVF clinic. And of course, uh, wanted had a very similar vision as me, which is individualization, making sure that we are all for the patient, making sure that it's about the journey, not necessarily always the result. Now, what were the steps involved? Uh, like any entrepreneur, you know, and but I'm, I was a scientist, I knew nothing about business. So how would I start the journey? And of course, you know, we knew that we needed a business plan, we needed the clear how, why, when, and where to start. We needed to raise the investment uh, that was very important. We needed about 1.5 million pounds to kind of uh, start a small scale clinic. Location, how do we decide where we want it to be? How much space do we need? What is the affordability price per square foot? Uh, how much space is necessary to begin a small scale clinic? What kind of staffing do we, do we need? Um, how many nurses, how many doctors, et cetera, et cetera? What equipment do we need? What are the fixed costs? which essentially there is no running away from, you know, whether your business works or whether it doesn't work, your fixed costs are there to stay. So do you have enough capital for those kind of rainy months, um, which all needs to really be accounted for in a business plan? Leasing, are we gonna buy the place? Are we gonna uh, rent the space? What is the lease term on the space? Um, what are we gonna call the clinic? Um, what about search engine optimization? Um, we need something which, uh, the, you know, is, is the, na the name has to be simple and yet it needs to say what's on the can, easy to remember. And of course, our journey started with typically four people, we, which we established, which we needed, which is one nurse, one embryologist, one doctor and one admin. Now, of course, the business plan. Um, I didn't know how to do this. I had no idea how to do this. Uh, we hired the service of a a uh, corporate brand uh, called RSM, who are uh, leading business analysts and kind of, of international repute as well. And of course, they were not cheap. We spent almost 28,000 pounds to kind of get the business plan done. And needless to say that we had no investors at this point. We needed to bring up the business plan in order to get the investment. So a lot of this money came out from the pockets of the two founders or the co-founders, which was me and my, my clinician partner. So a lot of that upfront money had to come from somewhere and we had to find it. And it was our own money, of course. So we developed a business plan. There was a good four months of brainstorming because the business plan is a framework, but essentially you need to sit and populate that. So not only the business plan, the financial model had to be created with a five to seven year projection, because this is what your investors want to see. The investors are not going for the, the name of the individual. They're essentially want to see whether there is return to their investment and when you, whether you have a solid business plan, which is going to give them their money back and more. So it is very important that you do not get emotional about uh, the fact that um, you know, you're being questioned as an individual. No, you're not being questioned as an individual. It is the robustness of your business uh, that is on paper that is being challenged and questioned. So be prepared that you, you need to know your business plan inside out. So this is very, very important that you're able to defend it when you are put on the spot by your investors and when you go to the market. So of course, you know, these kind of figures and these kind of charts and uh, bar graphs and uh, 
are, are very common when you're going through this entrepreneurial metamorphosis, which is, you know, you, you need to know what your costs are going to be, what your overheads are going to be in operational year one at the setup. At the setup phase, of course, there's money going in. There's no money coming out. The typical setup phase in <clears throat> the UK, when it comes to the regulatory requirements and the framework, is around one year. So we needed to have money, which meant that we were pumping in money for the first year and getting not a single penny out of it. So that is what we call the setup cost and operational year one cost. And of course, as I said, there's so many various um, fields that need to be populated whereby your business analysts need the numbers from you. They will populate the model, but the numbers have to come from you, which have got to be sense checked before there is any output of figures when it comes to the returns at year three, year four, year five, how your clinic is or your business is meant to grow based on the vision of the founders. So we then went to market. Once we got the business plan done, the financial model done. And of course, we wanted to attract investors who obviously do have a share capital in the business, but at the same time, what are they planning to bring to the table? We just didn't want uh, investors who were going to be uh, investing the money. We needed the expertise, especially being a very small brand. We wanted um, you know, uh, so some value that was being brought to the table by the investors. So negotiations are very, very common also at the initial stages when you pitch your project to the market and to the investors. What are you prepared to give for what is always the discussion. What is the equity that you're prepared to part with? Um, you know, uh, identify your key investors that you really want to attract. Um, ideally try and get someone who's a clinician who can potentially also bring in some business or referrals, uh, look at some marketing experts. So elements that can cost your business quite a lot of money in the form of advice, see if you can attract them as investors because essentially you're kind of getting that skill set, um, you, you know, potentially free of charge. So um, the IVF London uh, stakeholders or shareholders in, included one gynecologist, one urologist, one marketing expert, and the two uh, founders of the business. So th this is what uh, was our project. So, of course, we raised 1.2 million through this. We were still a bit short of money, but you know, we said, let's start it off. And as the business attains some momentum and groundwork, once the clinic uh, build work has started, then we can potentially attract some more investment because that the bricks and mortar have started grow, uh, going into the project and uh, it will also raise the valuation potentially of the next round of investment. So the founders needed to invest themselves to show commitment to the business. So all of our investors, the first question they asked us is, well, you're in very prominent jobs, but what are you putting into this business to make us realize that our money is secure? So we ourselves as founders, had to invest quite a bit of our own money in order to show the commitment that we, and, and of course, you know, um, the commitment is one thing, but uh, your dedication towards uh, making sure that your own money grows together with the investors. Salary sacrifice, that is very important. So the first year we had already built into our business plan that the founders are not gonna be taking any kind of salary and were potentially gonna be working uh, free of charge for the business to live their dream project. The location we had chosen, we had identified an earmarked, a location called Elstree <clears throat> in Hertfordshire. We are part, uh, you know, the location is part of a business park. It was a purpose-built facility, but that was the beauty of it, that we got a blank canvas of about 6,000 square foot, and we built the walls, uh, everything, the whole project, the clinic, the design, everything was done by an embryologist and, of course, my co-founder, whereby we put uh, everything on paper based on how we saw the whole process flowing in an IVF clinic. So there was an advantage of uh, starting this uh, groundwork right from the beginning in terms of even building the premises. Of course, we had to hire builders, architects, surveyors that all had the experience in building medical faci facilities. References were very important of who you choose to uh, accompany you on this journey, including the builders, quotations, 
contracts, you almost have to pay 30% uh, above the quotation. So you need to have the buffer for that as well. Just like how when you're doing your, 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 your uh, residential property, you know, you're always going to exceed on the budget. So you then need to focus on the legals. You need to hire uh, good lawyers who will uh, do all your shareholders agreement, your articles of association, uh, the lease. Uh, and of course, negotiating the lease is very, very important. It's a very uh, strong commitment when it comes to a legally binding document. You need to negotiate a rent-free period as well with your um, landlord if you're going to be renting the premises. And all this costs money. And this really needs to be built into your business plan or financial model. <clears throat> we started building the project in October 2017. And of course, the delivery project was around nine months. And once the project started, the build work, there was a major uh, disaster, in, so to speak, in my own. Uh, journey, which was the two founders fell out. And this was a big change in the whole journey for IVF London and for me. And of course, there were several emotions that ran through my mind at that time, that as an embryologist, can I lift this off? The whole project relies on two key people. The strength of an, any IVF clinic is a good co-clinician and a good co-embryologist. I had lost that half uh, wheel that runs the car. I had lost a wheel that runs the car. Am I gonna be able to do this? The journey has just started. We've just started literally putting up walls in the clinic. All the money had been raised. The investors were all looking up to wanting to get a return for their investment, of course. How am I gonna be able to do this? All that pressure on my shoulders, and I felt it in, in, in a hard way. Anyway, I had decided that the show will go on, the show must go on. And that was the point that I really felt that I, I can't let anyone down, including myself. I had pledged my bottom dollar to this project. And I said, I will do it. I'll try and get all the help that I can, but yet I will do it. I can't let the project shelf. What were my options at that really turbulent point? And of course, this was still a very beginning stage of the journey. Um, you know, the long and short and the, a lot of thinking had gone into that, that what are my options? I have uh, been, you know, I, I, I felt very paralyzed at that point. I had already left a very secure and a very well-paid job. All the investment had been raised, as I said. Construction had started, we were already in the lease. Uh, stressful is embarrassing, you know, to shelve a project when you have essentially gathered all that money. Um, do I continue? Do I offer to buy out the other partner who had already invested the money, my co-founder? Um, and we all know that this partnership is absolutely vital in order to have a successful IVF, um, you know, entrepreneurial journey. So these were all the options and these were all the things that were running through my mind at that time. And of course, the buyout, which was one of the options, the buyout of the other co-founder uh, involved legalities. It involved further costs. Um, we needed a lot more money to buy her, um, you know, not, not just to buy her out because the, the, the buyout was quite a big um, commitment, but we needed to agree on a settlement. And when there was a fallout, you, you barely were talking. And these are like any kind of relationship fallouts that it leads to such a um, sour situation that even communicating with each other professionally becomes a challenge. So these were all the challenges we were going through as well. Like how do you agree on these things? How do you settle? How do you uh, proactively and, and methodically go through a business divorce, so to speak? The decision I made was to continue the journey, because for me, there was no other journey but to continue with this. And of course, there were challenges that were being met as I, I, as I went along. There were clinical decisions that needed to be, be made, which was not in my realm or capacity to do, because the, the operating theater had to be designed. What exactly we need in terms of the compliance when it comes to the surgical uh, uh, suite and the theater and the uh, regulation, I had no experience. I had experience on the lab, not necessarily the clinical aspects. I read up on every aspect that needed 
to be read upon, which was not in my scope or horizon, but I challenged myself that I have to do it. There is no easy way out now. We're in this journey and we have to continue. So, uh, you know, a lot of reading. Um, the construction was completed of the project in July 2018. It took almost 10 months uh, to construct the clinic. The equipment got installed in August 2018. We got our inspection in the same month, into August 2018, and we were licensed as a fertility clinic in September 2018 by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Needless to say, this was one of the first clinics in the country that was embryology led and designed by a clinical embryologist and not necessarily a clinician. This is how it all started with a basic plan on the wall um, you know, of the different rooms, the construction plan, how we envisaged the, the process to flow from one process to the other. We typically had um, a construction plan of about four consulting rooms, one big laboratory, one theater, in fact, one embryo transfer room and uh, so on. So this was our basic roadmap when it came, comes to the clinic layout. This is what the journey started with. You can see that there is literally an empty shell there. We rented 6,000 square foot um, and then all the walls had to be constructed. But this is what the day one looked like where it was an empty shell. This is what two weeks into the project looked like. All the air ventilation systems started going in. All the walls started coming up. The metal frames started coming up. The div division of rooms were being done. Uh, and of course, um, I could see that the skeleton was coming up. In three months into the construction, all the walls were up. Um, again, the air handling units were all fitted. Uh, we could see that the project was taking shape and various aspects of the clinic were coming together. And the final product, this is what the clinic looked like on the day when all the validation was being done, um, you know, the theater, uh, the um, embryo transfer room, our little laboratory with very minimal equipment at that time. And of course, our front reception, which, um, you know, again, was very minimalistic, but at the same time had the core elements of what it really needed to start the project off. So the ethos of Ivy of London, of course, I wanted to bring in everything that I had always heard about from a patient's perspective that they really wanted in their ideal IVF clinic. And because we were small, <clears throat> we were boutique, we wanted to make sure that we really bring in all the, all, all the aspects that are really going to be the business drivers of this project. Personalized care, the notion that it's all about the journey and it's all about the journey leading to success. So a very holistic approach as well. We uh, try to differentiate ourselves from our competitors by creating some brand awareness around nutrition, reflexology, acupuncture, the continuity of care is very important. Empowering the patient is very important that they feel in the navigation seat when it comes to their own treatment. So that is very important, certainly in a very Caucasian population here in the UK, whereby the patients are so empowered in the knowledge. Dr. Google is the biggest thing that has happened and they know more about fertility treatment than their fertility experts. So you have to be ready to be um, uh, to, to, to be empowering them and to be challenged in many ways as well. We're in a very digitized era and the control has to be given in a very digitized way to the patient as well. The results are very important. And of course, the most important thing is learn from the feedback that you get all the time, every time, act on it. You're new, you have only to learn and improvise. So the core values and the mission statement at IVF London was always three core things, care, innovation, excellence. And this is what we still today live up to when it comes to our work day in, day out. Care, what did care mean to me? Care meant treat patients like kings, they are in control, provide them emotional support at various stages, which is also a very core element of the regulatory requirements when it comes to the HFEA. Get to know them and their sensitivities. You are their counselor in this journey. You are their confidant in this journey. Provide them a very hand-holded and a personalized service. Make those regular calls to patients. 
find out how they are in this journey because we all know that this is not an easy journey to go through. Um, we almost had a, uh, a very strong uh, rule that emails and calls have to be answered same day within three rings, especially with the calls, emails answered the same day. The founder, I e. myself, met all my patients. I did. I wanted to know them very personally. I wanted to know them. Like my father always told me, and my father was a very successful businessman, nothing to do with medicine. But one thing he always told me that, Alpesh, whatever marketing you do, one of the core elements of marketing is make those first 10 customers happy and they will bring the next 100. And that's exactly what was the vision in my head that whatever strategies I use, whether that was digital marketing, whether that was um, going and meeting, um, you know, our, uh, our, our stakeholders, you know, our business partners, et cetera, we wanted to make sure that we made those first 10 patients happy so that they spread your word and wave your flag. So of course, you know, there are various stages of contact, the deck collection, embryo transfer, two week wait, test results, et cetera, et cetera, which I was very personally involved with in making sure that the patients were being kept on top of all the information. What was innovation to me? Embrace technology. It was all about technology. We were moving towards a very exciting phase in IVF, which was to do with technology, tech, artificial intelligence. We need to embrace it. I'm one of those scientists that really loves innovating, metamorphosizing, making sure that I don't use the same strategies that I used 10 years ago. Keep on developing. Um, you know, my age tells you that I've been in, in, in this business for a long time. And yet one of the things that I'm continuously very proud of is the dynamism, the change, the innovation, uh, the journey. What are we going to do different next year? So these are all the things which meant innovation. Of course, being a lab person, innovation to me meant innovation in the laboratory. How are we going to uh, innovate in the clinical space? How are we going to digitize the journey? What are we going to do in the lab, which is AI related and, and yet giving us the edge when it comes to selecting the right embryos, journal clubs, don't be scared of change, embrace change. What kind of budgets are going to be required when it comes to innovating from year one to year two? Keep the basics right is what I always say. Try and learn a walk first, learn how to walk, and then you run. Like anything, establish your core elements of your IVF clinic, and then start investing heavily in the time lapse and the digitization and the AI. These are all the bells and whistles once you have got your core elements in place. But if you try and run before you can walk, you will have nothing but obstacles and a lot of uh, trip points and trip hazards. Excellence. What does excellence mean to me? Results. Results driven, patient feedback. This is what excellence means. Regular assessment of lab and clinical KPIs. We all know that KPIs forms the framework of basic quality management nowadays. Complaints, and of course, complaints can be turned into compliments. And this is one of the biggest things that I talk about in my uh, daily life, even when I'm training my managers, my key uh, department leads, one thing I tell them is don't run away from getting feedback and don't run away from getting complaints. You will get complaints, but use those complaints in order to improve. Make those complaints or turn them into compliments. This is very, very important through this journey. Let your patients who have complained come and tell you that, you know, I'm so proud and, and I'm so happy that I gave you that feedback that you have actually turned my journey around into a very positive one because you have incorporated all those points that I mentioned to you and it's really made my journey good going forward. Quality management is very key. The non-conformities have to be logged. The optimization of the processes is very important. Regular audits, and it goes without saying, those of you all that who are embryologists in this forum, you know that audits have become part and parcel of our life. It's not just the embryology that we do, 
we also have to be involved in very regular um, audits of our practices, our, our performances, et cetera, et cetera. Regular team meetings, whether that's daily or uh, weekly or quarterly, those are all very important. Three years in, and of course, we're now almost five years into the journey, but this uh, slide was in three years in. What did the team look like? We were two embryologists, one clinic manager, two doctors, five nurses, three admin team, one compliance manager, and one business development manager. So that was the core team after three years of being established. The vision for the future, we built up obviously a five-year focus for IVF London to build its brand. We were then looking and we're now in, in year five, we've just finished four years and we're into the fifth year now. We're now looking at opportunities to grow IVF London as a brand, uh, whether that is locally or whether that is internationally. And I think my, my, um, my will and, and, and my vision is to grow internationally rather than uh, domestically. I am myself, I, I, I'm of Indian origin, uh, but I'm born and brought up in Kenya, in East Africa. One thing that was very close to my heart that I wanted to do something in Kenya for the people who really can't afford IVF. And we all know that infertility is not just a treatment for the elite, it affects everyone. You know, and essentially everyone should have the um, ability to access IVF and low cost IVF is certainly my vision and one of my, one of my core elements that I really want to deliver in the next couple of years when it comes to Africa. So, um, you know, certainly we're looking into that space now going forward. Everything has to be patient centric. Uh, you have to really provide the Bentley experience to your clients, to your patients, uh, because ultimately there is no there is no dearth of competition. We know that you know, our field is contaminated with contamination. There's good competition, bad competition. There is some big cowboys out there, but how are you gonna differentiate yourself from your competitors and the competition around? Look at your marketing initiatives very closely, create the education awareness amongst uh, your patients, your team, your team are your strength, your, your staff are taking your vision forward empower them with your vision. They don't know what your vision is. They need to learn. They need to really learn from you because they are the ones who are going to be delivering your vision to your clients. And your clients are going to be seeing your vision through the eyes of your staff. So these were the first few kind of successes that we had. That was IVF London's first baby that was born, baby Ezra. That was the first cycle of IVF that we treated. And by God's grace, we were very fortunate that we got a pregnancy out of it. And then of course, the positive journey continued in terms of delivering happiness to our, our, our lovely patients who believed in us. This uh, gentleman had just come to me for a semen analysis on the, door, on the day we opened the doors of IVF London. He was in a secondary relationship. This was his second partner. Uh, he'd had a very kind of disturbed um, first marriage. When he came for a, a semen analysis, he was oligospermic. Uh, they were trying to conceive, nothing was happening. His partner was very anxious, wanted to get on to the IVF bandwagon. He just came for a semen analysis and he told me, Alpesh, do you mind if I bring my partner to come and see you and meet you? Because I'm really impressed with um, what you're telling me in terms of how you can help me. So they believed in us. And of course, um, they had a lovely baby. They were the ones invited for the first one year celebration at IVF London and baby Ezra cut the cake with the world's first IVF baby, Louise Brown, on the auspices of IVF London on our facility. And here we are, Louise Brown has held baby Ezra um, one year into the project of IVF London and she cut the cake, world's first IVF baby and IVF London's first baby got together sharing the platform. We were very fortunate that we invited some, uh, you know, very prominent dignitaries. The mayor had attended as well. And of course, um, it was a very proud moment for me to cross this one year. And of course, the journey, this is my family, my uh, IVF London family, as we call it. We started the team with, a, as I said, the core elements, a couple of nurses, doctors. So I'm very thankful to my team that started this journey with me, who supported me through the vision of 
starting IVF London. And this is uh, something very uh, close to my heart. I gave this as a memento to all our patients who had a successful live birth for their little babies, which said my first babysitter was an embryologist. And of course, the journey continues. We have got an amazing patient rating on the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority uh, website. We continue getting uh, amazing feedback from our patients. Every feedback is important, whether that's positive or negative. We got rated as one of the top fertility clinics in the UK by the Duff magazine. And of course, success rates are paramount. You have to make sure that you deliver good success rates. These are what are some of our innovative projects have been over the last three years. We have really tried to, as, though, as Mr. Vinesh said, that we really need to empower our um, patients and women and men to preserve their fertility, especially if we're going to move into this era of wanting to delay parenthood because of empowering ourselves with regards to careers, education, et cetera. So we need to educate our patients very positively. And a lot of your marketing, marketing initiatives have to be based on that front as well. We do regularly Insta Lives as well to educate our patients and direct marketing to the consumer. Of course, this is a, a nice vision board of the various successes I've shared um, over the last few years, the babies that are born, the team, uh, you know, the happy patients. And these are just a few of the very happy pictures that we have created and the memories that we've created for our patients. And of course, the team continues to grow. We had a baby party just um, in September last year. We invited a lot of the happy patients and some of them came, they brought their babies. And of course we were in the middle of the pandemic. So very, uh, not that many people came, but whoever came, you know, uh, really supported us by bringing their children to meet us as well. And of course, um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I always um, say that the worst part of life is waiting. The best part is having someone worth waiting for. And of course, um, one of my favorite quotes don't wait for the inspiration, be the inspiration. This is my little journey. This is my little world. This is my world that will take me forward, hopefully, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alpesh, for that very inspirational uh, lecture, talk, motivational speech. I mean, everything combined together because it had like points which would help an embryologist or anyone uh, start an IVF center. It had points where we wanted like to help us improve our branding, to help us improve our business. And it also had points to help us improve our mindset uh, into like evolving towards running practices. I think it was absolutely uh, fantastic. So we do have a few questions for all of you and I would request uh, all panelists to please switch on their uh, cameras, uh, unmute themselves. <laughs> And we can uh, quickly go uh, towards the discussion. I think I'll start with Alpesh only because uh, it's relevant to uh, his lecture. I mean, I think there's a question for you which says, how much time does it take for an IVF clinic to become successful? Uh, that's a very, uh, very good question and a million dollar question. Well, if you had asked me this question in year one of my journey, I would have said, you know, never. I, I never thought that IVF London would even start up with the, uh, with the problems that I had faced in my journey, at least at that beginning. Uh, but a lot of hard work goes into it. And of course, there is no magic Bible here, Keshav. You know, you learn, you're the, you're the founder, you know your business, you should know your business, you know what your core vision is. But I would say if I was to put a, a number to it, it takes five years for any project to, to kind of lift off. And we're still in that journey. By no means have we completed the journey, but I, self, I, I really say you need to give yourself three to five years. As Mr. Modi had told me once that uh, three years, he said, before three years, don't take a holiday, you know, because that's what it will take for your project. And I remember him every day because he's given me a lot of inspiration in this journey. Absolutely. I so think he's yeah, I just need to ask a question, Alpesh. You know, I'm an active angel investor and we see all these business plans and Excel spreadsheets which show all this hockey stick growth, which actually none of us ever look at or believe. I'm just wondering, you know, what your business plan was and what the actuality was. Did you compare the two? So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mahampani, for that question. Now, um, not being a very hardcore business person myself, 
I, when I went through a bit of a fallout with my co-founder, one thing that scared me was that I needed to live through that business plan and financial model very meticulously if I was going to be planning and spending everyone's money, including mine. So there was a point that I didn't trust myself with my own money because, and, and, and that's why the question that you posed to me is a very relevant one because in theory, for people who manage and handle money, it's a very good question that these things are more academic exercises and not necessarily, you don't execute them in your day in day out life. But I did simply because of the fear that I needed to stay to that business plan and to this date, Dr. Malpani, I look at it. I look at what my incomings, outgoings are, whether I'm on track, whether I'm ahead of my financial model, uh, whether I'm behind on my financial model. Even during COVID, I brought the financial model out that apparently no one had envisaged uh, the turbulence that we're facing from a corporate and financial perspective. But how has that skewed my five vision plan because unfortunately my five-year plan fell within that very turbulent COVID period. Absolutely and I think I think majority of it happened during uh, the COVID period Alpesh and uh, I think like my visit to you uh, last week was such it was such a revelation because I really feel that now I mean looking at you I, I feel that embryologists would make better administrators because we do play with our numbers in, inside the laboratory. We play with our KPIs. I mean, we have a better understanding of it. And I think uh, it's it's a great opportunity for whoever wants to step into the business side of things. I mean, you still have certain amount of things that you can bring forward to uh, within the clinic. Or even if, you, if you're not stepping into an administrative role, you can actually contribute towards an administrative role within the clinic. And I think that's one key area where I think we should start uh, pitching in. I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Malpani. I think uh, this is from uh, Akansha. Uh, she's asking, uh, how do you venture into medical tourism? And I'll have a follow-up question to the same uh, for Vishal, uh, which I'll ask after you answer this. Okay. So quite frankly, I don't like that word at all. Patients aren't tourists. Tourists go out for fun. Patients want a baby, which is why they come and because they can't afford the treatment or the wait lists are long or whatever else, they're forced to look for alternatives. I don't think there's any reason to treat an Indian patient any different from a patient who comes from overseas. The medical needs are the same. The requirements are the same. In a way, I think it's good because these patients are far more demanding. I think sometimes, you know what, medical college in India gives doctors this sense of arrogance. Uh, you know, professors know everything. Uh, Patients are often poor, they don't question you. And then some of this hubris starts getting reflected. And that's commonest complaint of Indian patients is doctors don't talk to them. Doctors don't share information. Doctors are never available. And once you start treating foreign patients, you understand that they're not going to let you get away with that kind of behavior. So I think it's a humbling experience. But I think it's important to treat all patients equally well. And anyone who allows you to do that, whether this is a well-educated Indian patient who stayed abroad, and therefore is more demanding or compared to someone else. The trouble is, especially for Indian doctors, when they see demanding patients, their first response is often one of offense. Yeah. Or if you think you're so smart, go treat yourself, go read Dr. Google or go somewhere else. They get offended. I think that's a big mistake. There's so much we can learn from our patients. And the more difficult patients are the ones who teach you the most. I, I think I really like that answer because, I mean, going by personal experience as well, there are so many patients who would read so much and come to you. And I mean, it's just, uh, it gives you an opportunity to read read more and learn more. And even tackling these patients is also an, a skill that you have to learn. So uh, I completely agree with you. But staying on the question here, she also has a follow-up. Uh, Vishal, I'd like you to answer this one. Uh, uh, it probably has to do with branding. How do you attract foreign patients uh, to your IVF center? Uh, okay, so it's it's pretty simple. Uh, it, it, the solutions are pretty simple, but uh, in terms of execution, it becomes a challenge. Uh, 
SEO happens to be the best bet. Uh, Google AdWords happens to be the second best bet. Bet uh, social media uh, promotion in a very very targeted format uh, also is something which you can look into. Uh, these are the three core activities in terms of instant lead generation, as we would talk about. However, this lead generation needs to be supported by certain credibility uh, building exercise and the branding that your brand stands for, the IBF clinic that it stands for. So having a very robust online presence uh, uh, and uh, inbound links uh, or what people are talking about you in other blogs and other places needs to be present so that when they fill it up, you can call on that information and showcase their credibility over there. I mean, when you talk about Google AdWords, I mean, it's 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 like an auction. Every, it changes every day, like people outbid you every single day. <laughs> How do you keep up with it? I mean, for a small clinic, I have a question for you, Vinesh, uh, next. But Vishal, as a small clinic, how do you fight with uh, corporates uh, and still keep like uh, have some leverage from all of these platforms so go very very focused do not bid on the high uh, uh, cost terms uh, pick up the ones which has got a reasonably good amount of monthly search volume and at the same time so monthly search volume is basically the number of times people are searching on that particular keyword so go for those small uh, quantity monthly search volume or medium quantity monthly search volume keywords and uh, bid again do not bid for the first position because that is always expensive go for the second or the third position uh, uh, for that and uh, for a small clinic the doctor or the embryologist themselves putting in the time is not uh, uh, advisable outsource it to a freelancer outsource it to an agency so that they can keep a tab on the uh, the bidding process and how do you like uh, keep a track of it i mean do you do it on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis i mean so it depends on the budget spend, uh, uh, Keshav, honestly. So if your budget spend is very high, you need to do it on a daily basis. Uh, 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 if it's it's medium or if it's low, you can do it on a, a, a once a week basis or once every alternate day kind of a basis. Uh, but uh, that is something that you can keep a tab on. I mean, a daily report can be automated and generated to you. And the only parameter that you need to keep on check is the average cost per click and the, uh, 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 the position that you are ranking at. And the conversions that are happening so if you keep a tab on these three parameters and monitor them on an automated basis on a daily uh, base then you you can't be going wrong absolutely thank you so i much. have i have an opinion about that but we let Vinesh yeah. first yeah. no i think i will uh, get your opinion first because then i'll switch the topic oh okay so you know i wear multiple hats i am an investor so obviously a lot of my startups do spend money on google adwords i buy shares in google which is actually very profitable because most of these startups end up consuming their money on, uh, you know, buying these things. And I think uh, it's there's a lot of lure with a lot of a lot of these platforms effectively use what I call vanity metrics. They show you things like engagement and impressions and stuff like that. But until you complete the loop, it's very hard to say. So we have terms like customer acquisition costs. You may say, okay, even if one patient comes in and you you make a lack, then isn't it okay to spend? you know, a thousand rupees or a hundred rupees on each particular this thing. And I actually think that's a mugs game. I think it's important to learn to experiment and then you can decide. You shouldn't let people take you for a ride. And the only way to do that is learn some of this stuff yourself. And the good news is the dashboards allow you enough information. There are enough courses on Udemy, courses which you can pick up for yourself and then decide. The trouble is that it becomes such a sink and you end up consuming so much money so quickly that actually distracts you from what you should be doing. So I would be, I would be very wary about some of this stuff. Got it. And the space is evolving uh, so quickly. Now people have converted Instagram into a complete marketing tool. Alpesh, I'll get you in when we're talking about marketing. You, you do use Instagram for quite a lot of your... Uh, branding and uh, even um, a lot of uh, live sessions that you do, I've attended quite a few of them. Does that really help you out? Does that attract patients? Um, I mean, what's your patient's take on, on all of these things that you do? So uh, it's a good, I mean, I'm not a marketing person uh, at all, but I've just learned marketing in this journey, the very little that I've had to learn. And I think uh, as both of our speakers have said that uh, it's very important to invest in digital marketing. Um, and 
uh, you know, so we, we've stayed away from the big spends like TV and radio and things like that, because that was not in our budget. And I said, you know, the, the cost per click is very important. Then, you know, the Google AdWords, of course, as Dr. Malpani said, we went for the mid-level uh, keywords, you know, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Vishal said we went for the mid-level keywords. Um, yes, we do spend quite a bit on SEO. And of course, when we started, we didn't have all that budget, but now we do spend a bit on SEO. Uh, we focus purely on SEO when it comes to the customer acquisition. We do uh, cost per click. Yes, I do social media as well. All this has now been outsourced. But as Dr. Malpani said, that is very important that you do have an eye and the knowledge to question all these people who are working for you. Because otherwise, tell, let me tell you, you get taken for a ride. 100%. No one has got the time to put into this than a, the man themselves, which is the owner or the founder or whatever you call it. So you need to know how to interpret those analytics. They will have a 20 minute chat with you every month, but do you have the bandwidth to understand what they're telling you? And if you don't have the bandwidth, trust me, it's not gonna go anywhere. You need to have the ability to question them. Um, and certainly that's been my experience. But the Insta Live is because I did not have that level of bandwidth to question all these digital experts, I said, I need to find a way of communicating to my audience directly. And they, how are they going to know about that? That is if I reach out to them directly. So that was my initiatives and efforts from a Insta Live perspective. So I Alpish, that's, that's, Alpish, that's great because you chose a particular channel and then you decided to focus on that, to use Vishal's word, because the reality is the multiple channels. At one point, perhaps it was Facebook, you know, tomorrow it's going to be whatever it is. You need to be where your patients are. And definitely, you know, in this reproductive age group, all the patients are on Insta. Mm -hmm. The beauty is it's such a democratic platform that you don't need to burn a lot of money in order to get in a following. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't need to do it yourself. Just find a bright nurse or embryologist or whatever else, what I call the digital natives who live on their smartphone anyway, and then experiment. It doesn't cost you anything. You know, put up five videos, put up 50 videos. Who's stopping you? The more the videos you put up, the greater the probability that one of them will go viral. I'm yes. using the word viral very deliberately because no one can predict any of this stuff. Anyone who pretends they can is just taking you for a ride. So all I'm saying is you can experiment. It's free. And if nothing else, you'll enjoy it. Absolutely. So Vinesh, uh, coming to you, I think uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, our landscape now. Uh, I think there's a lot of fear amongst smaller clinics now, whether they'll be able to comply with all the regulations and still keep the business uh, profitable. I mean, how do you, what do you envision for smaller units? Uh, are we looking at an era where corporates are going to take over uh, the whole space? and uh, these smaller players will ultimately die down. I mean, what's your take on this? So uh, for any questions we have on, uh, in my mind also for landscape of uh, any business, I mean, not only IVF, we look at business which are more mature than ours. So I generally look at uh, a more mature developed market where they are today. So we will we know that where we can evolve and reach there tomorrow. Uh, in that context, uh, uh, I strongly believe that there is a market for organized players and there is market for individual players and it will continue like this. It's just that my belief, and I, it's very subjective right or wrong, um, I believe that why organized players are growing faster in India today is because they have better adoptability of seeing this as a business and have a very professional approach to it. And when it comes to laws and regulations, why people, I mean, like me or any organized chain or management person will not be very fearful is because we know we will have to adopt to it, the change and keep growing. So for individual IVF clinics, I would not term small and big, small and big. I mean, it's time for, uh, 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 for an owner, CEO, who is either doctor or embryologist or a, or a business professional, <laughs> adopt to this change and make the business more uh, SOP driven, process driven, system driven, rather than perception, gut and people driven. And you will be through this turbulence and uh, will survive and will grow. So okay. it's more about uh, ability to adopt the change rather than being single or organized. Got it. I'll, I'll follow it up to Dr. Malpani here. I mean, uh, Vinesh is talking about uh, 
businesses, I mean, IVF being a business, but when most of the clinics are being run by doctors, I think it's a constant struggle for doctors to think of it as a business. They think of it as a service. I mean, do we really have to change our mindsets here and really focus on running the business as well as offering the service? I mean, how, how do we really work in this? You know, I don't know how politically incorrect I'm allowed to be, but honestly, at this stage <laughs> in my <laughs> life, I honestly don't care <laughs> anymore. Are. So I'm, I'm going to say what I really believe. I think part of it is, and you know, I'm not complaining. I'm saying this is the reality. The sooner we accept it, the better. Whether it's the education system, whether it's the healthcare system, everything's got progressively commercialized. Yeah. There used to be a time when I was proud to be a doctor, very honestly. I'm a second generation doctor and, you know, we would do all these things and bring happiness to patients' lives and all that stuff. And I'm not so sure I'm very proud of being a doctor anymore. And I think it's doctors like us who are to blame because we can see a lot of malpractices which are happening. And we either choose to take the approach, you know, it's none of my business. I'm not my brother's keeper. Let other people do what they like. You know, I will do all the ethically right things. And unfortunately, you know, anytime mud is splashed, some of it gets onto you also. And as a result of which, when we keep on talking about the doctor-patient relationship, the key element is trust. And the fact of the matter is patients don't have that trust. So the first half of every consultation is convincing the patient, hey, look, you know, I am trustworthy, which is such a far cry from 30 years ago when the default was, yes, you're a good doctor, you're going to do what's right for the patient. I think that's the elephant in the room. Do I have any simple solutions to any of this? Absolutely not. And in fact, that's what I told Ashish. The reason I don't bother to educate doctors is because doctors are of two kinds. The good doctors don't need to be told anything. They're ethical. They will do what's right, you know, more power to them. And the bad ones, no matter what you tell them, they're not going to improve just because I give them a lecture. So there's very little point, which is why our focus has always been on patients. We want patients to be able to differentiate between good doctors and bad doctors. And the moment that happens, that creates a positive virtuous cycle because patients trust other patients much more than they trust doctors, especially someone who's been through an IVF cycle. So actually our message is, we tell all patients just demand one thing, and I'm using the word demand very deliberately, photographs of embryos every time you do an IVF cycle. That puts patients in the driver's seat. That actually puts embryologists in the driver's seat because the only thing an IVF clinic can do is make embryos. And if you're making good quality embryos, documenting that and sharing with patients, I think everyone stands to win. But again, just my opinion and not a very popular one. Got it. Vishal, I'll bring you in here. I mean, do you do you believe that uh, in this era, everyone should have like a PR person handling uh, their image? Because I mean, most of it, like let me, when you're talking about building trust, I mean, is our image, what, what is being portrayed, uh, uh, building trust for us? I mean, because most of the media is negative against doctors and even in the IVF space, it's, it's very negative at the moment. So... So, How does one, one handle this? Yeah, so in fact, I, I think the other way around, the era of PR professionals is slowly dwindling. Uh, the reason being is that the tools that you have on your hands as an average individual, as an average professional or a business are so accessible, are so easy, are so free of cost. They are so in your palm, right? So you can uh, connect with your audience whenever and in whatever format you want to connect with. So uh, uh, hiring a PR is not something which I would recommend uh, uh, unless and until you are an extremely large uh, 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 organization and you want to uh, 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 run a campaign or uh, uh, run a messaging across platforms. Otherwise, uh, a PR professional is not required. Uh, what is the other part of your question, Kweisha? I mean, when we are, when we are fighting an image uh, which in the society is so negative, how does one build trust? I mean, what are the tools that we can use to actually like make patients more comfortable and make patients walk into our clinics and more patients walk into our clinics? Okay, so the tools are very much the same for what you're asking. It's, it's the social media uh, 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 platform, which is there as a tool. It is a content that you generate on uh, uh, and post over there. 
right? So the content that you use to create, so be it testimonials from existing patients, a Q&A session with the patients, uh, the journey of a patient right from beginning till the time the childbirth has taken place, uh, all those kind of things, the more you put it online, the more you put it on your social media platforms, that is what generates trust. Because at the end of the day, it is a word of mouth which, uh, uh, which uh, tills the favor uh, decision in your favor, right? So the more you have positive content about your brand, and I'm not saying written testimonials, video testimonials the more advantage uh, you have to counter that okay vinesh you want to step in oh, i'm just uh, taking thread from the last discussion which is very interesting i want to put a emphasis uh, I, I feel proud that i'm in business of ivf service i'm in business of creating happiness and i really feel that uh, business is a very positive word for me so it doesn't differentiate from service uh, I, I, I always feel this passion about being in a business which creates more happiness, which helps people to achieve the dream. And I never have gone away from the word that it separates from a, from a service from a doctor and a business from an IVF. So, thank you. Yeah, I got it. I mean, but I, the only reason I put up that question was I, I think I've seen a lot of doctors struggle with... Uh, thinking of it as a business, I, I think like even when I talk about our own setup, when we're thinking of marketing campaigns, we are so worried. I mean, would it, is it ethical? Is it, can we put this online? And when we look at different, uh, so many chains competing with all sorts of things, um, we are like, okay, let's just not do this because it's it's not something that we want to step into. Okay, sure. Sorry. sorry. Uh, my point yeah. is that even if it is business, it it can be, it should be 100% ethical and transparent. Absolutely. And I'll give you one example. 1995 or 1999, I was discussing one of the top five doctors in India about marketing their clinic, one clinic. And the doctor said that, oh, I do I need marketing? I am known across the world, yeah. across India. Then I gave example of Cadbury that time. It's just sound, sounding very weird, but it's very, very right. Cadbury was the only chocolate known in India. We used to name chocolate as Cadbury. But Cadbury had the very aggressive marketing campaign of Kuch Khas as Zindagi during that time. And then I could convince that doctor that marketing is a good word. It's a progressive word. It's a science. And we need to do this because you have to spread good word. You have to spread awareness, spread education, create acceptability. That is also part of marketing. And that doctor cycle grew from 15 a month to 50 a month in 15, in 12 months of effort. And it was very good. My point is that I, I agree that being in, uh, I, I knowing doctors from 30 years now, uh, this is uh, always a debate, but I just believe that uh, it's, it's right time to accept this, that marketing business are a progressively good word and it can be done with 100% ethics and transparency also. Brilliant. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think I think we can't afford to ignore the elephant in the room. As someone put in one of the comments, that if you run, if you're a doctor in an IVF clinic, you have targets to meet, there are revenue targets. If a patient walks in and you tell the patient, hey, you don't need IVF, you're going to lose your job. And I think just pretending that these things don't exist and saying everything is hunky-dory and ethical, we can't afford to do that. I mean, you know, effectively, I think it's partly because we turn a blind eye to some of these malpractices that they continue to uh, propagate. And, you know, I understand that no one wants to kind of, because who wants to be unpopular? Who wants to say, I don't think this is right. So everyone just keeps quiet and they complain behind closed doors, especially after you had three or four drinks. Yeah. I think we need to be a little more upfront about some of, if we don't learn to regulate ourselves, this is going to become a hundred times worse. I can guarantee you that. That's part of the reason we're seeing this regulatory backlash. We all knew that surrogacy was being exploited. It was being done for patients who didn't need it. It was being done and, you know, the surrogates were being exploited. We all knew that and we chose not to do anything because and that's exactly what's happened and it's going to progressively happen. I hope we wake up. I have a small point, Kesho. Yeah. Uh, usually I have seen that, uh, you know, the clinics do not have a challenge of giving success, but Having consistency in the result is very important. And also in the age of marketing, clinics also tend to copy or create an unsustainable goals or, you know, numbers. So if they stick to a sustainable growth model, then it should not be a problem because they are also human, but they also catch up into the 
storm of social media and you know all those kind of things. But Ashish, no one wants to get rich slowly, na? Everyone wants to get rich quickly. No, that's what I'm saying. There are many clinics or doctors I have seen. They have progressed over five years very sustainably and very quietly and very nicely. But the problem starts when you have aspiration which are not sustainable. Yeah. I'll I'll bring in Alpesh here because I think Alpesh uh, uh, gave me some advice uh, uh, on my last trip, and I think the question that I asked him was a success rate enough because most of the clinics are now achieving the same success rates, right? Stand practices are standard. So what else do you do in your clinic uh, to to like? Uh, so it's a very good rich? question. Yeah, thanks so much, and um, very good question. Um, no success rates are not enough because I think when you you when I left the clinic that I was working for and as Dr. Malpani very cleverly alluded to is that doctors often have or sorry Mr. Modi said this that doctors sometimes feel that oh marketing ki kya hai? Main itna prominent doctor na to wo mere zain mein bhi aisa hi kuch ego tha. Patient to aayenge na? Main to, I'm a very prominent embryologist. You know, the clinic used to be known because of me doing the embryology. So patient to aayenge, uske embryos lekar aayenge, you know, whatever. It's not the case. Trust me, it's not the case. There is more to a business than just the founder or the brand value or anything like that. And that hits you quite aggressively when the reality check comes that, hang on, where are the patients? And that's when you start believing in all these marketing initiatives and things like that. But hang on, no, I need to do more. So, you know, when we had that chat, Bishop, I think I, I, I learned from my own experience that A, that brand value of 25 years was not enough to pull the patients because patients don't know you from eternity. Secondly, patients want the continuity of care. They do not want to move just because person X and Y has moved because you're not a core element in the wheel. And what are the most important factors for people, for patients to walk through your doors? And realistically, in going by the UK consensus on the information that the HFPA has collected, apparently one of the most important factors is location. Even over success rates. Yes, you need decent success rates, but as you rightly said, everyone is doing decently nowadays. You know, We've got great culture media. We've got good uh, incubation system. We've got stable clinical practices. As embryologists, I govern stimulation day in, day out. Let me tell you, I know more stimulation than some of my doctors here. So, you know, I'm just saying that, look, look there is no magic to this now anymore. So what are the most important factors? Give your patients a Bentley experience. Again, what my father said, Make sure you focus on your first 10 to bring you the next 100. Thirdly, make sure that you attract your local clientele. I don't rely on central London clientele. I rely on a local clientele. Success rates are important, but in the, in the, in the, in the list of events, sorry, in the list of priority, location, uh, patient experience, success rates. Absolutely. And cost, Thanks. cost, cost, very important. Thank you, Alpesh. Okay, so uh, I think last question for all of you uh, before we end this. Since this is an event focused for embryologists, and I think this is a, a area of, of the field where uh, we are not looking at people stepping up, we are not looking at many embryologists coming up, showcasing themselves. What would be your top tips for embryologists to like build their personalities, build their brands, I mean, I'm sure everyone is doing fantastic work, but how do you showcase it? Uh, let's start with uh, Vishal first, and then I'll move to Dr. Malpani, Alpesh, and Ashishji as well. Vishal, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. So my advice would be to just invest in yourself as a brand. Identify the platform, identify your differentiation that you can offer, identify the messaging that you want to do and just invest in yourself. I have a son who is doing engineering physics and he's in second year and still I advise the same to him that invest in your own brand. Even if you want to go into research, even if you want to be a scientist, that is something that you need to do because that is what's going to last you uh, and you will never know when it has come to your uh, benefit. Uh, 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 when somebody is looking for you. So just invest in yourself uh, as a brand. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Malvani? 
I'd completely agree. The one advice I would give everyone is create your own website. I think so many things will automatically happen when you do that. You know, there are no code platforms. It doesn't cost more than a thousand rupees a month to have a world-class website. And the moment you do that, you will start learning so much because you have to compete with other websites, becomes a bit of an ego issue. You have to keep up to date with the latest technology. You have to understand words like digital marketing, social marketing. And when you're applying it to yourself, you'll automatically start creating content. And that's what I meant about a positive virtuous cycle. So if I had to give just one piece of advice, create your own personal website, make sure it gets populated on a regular basis, and then allow time for it to mature. Nothing magical is going to happen. People expect results. So, you know, as long as you're this thing, I think you'll be fine. But sure. Yeah. Alpesh? So, um, one thing I can say is don't fear um, aspects that you've never handled in your life. And I think I'm one of those living examples where I, I hadn't handled any of this. I hadn't managed money. I didn't know what business is about. But I think having fallen into the deep end, I learned and I learned uh, and I'm still learning how to swim. Uh, so if you believe that you have a spark in you uh, whereby you want to step into business, it's not an easy journey. Let me tell you, I didn't envisage of the multiple potholes that are going to come in my way uh, in order for my journey so far. But if you have an inclination, you want to do it, do it, believe in yourself. The, the, the road is turbulent, but you, you can get there if you follow some core elements. Vinesh, uh, if you're uh, with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for embryologist, I have one uh, very simple message. Believe in yourself because in the next decade in the industry, this is going to be the most priceless, uh, priceless professional uh, to be going behind. We will have everything possible for business, right capital, right market condition. But we will have, we will, what we will need is high quality embryologies, which is today in acute shortage, according to me. So keep believing in yourself. You have the most, most important phase coming in your life. Awesome. And Ashish ji, concluding remarks from you now. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Vishal, Dr. Malpani, Alpesh, and Vinesh has already said what has to be said. But one thing I always see when I travel outside India and India that uh, the, our Indian embryologist has to, you know, rise their game in clinical research and poster presentation in international era. Whenever I go outside, I firmly believe like Alpesh is there, all Indian origins are doing extremely well. We are good at skills. We are good in embryology. We are good in clinician, but we are not able to showcase our skills in terms of publishing papers, posters and bringing the India on the you know, world map. So I think we should have uh, some uh, target for each individual that at least I will publish one poster in international conference or Indian conference, and then subsequently rise up in that matter. Absolutely, and I'm sure uh, Shivani as a company uh, has always promoted embryologists and yes. in future events. I, I know quite a lot of the future events that are coming up are solely towards getting Indian embryologists to the platform that they actually uh, deserve. So with this, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, participating today. Thank you to all the participants. Wonderful just, discussion. Just, just one thing. Are you going to upload everything? Because I think sometimes that's helpful because you, know, you need to get the message across. So you might yeah. want to share a URL with everyone else. I think I, that's... that's yes, yes, we will do. We'll share the recording link to everyone. Yeah. Good. I think uh, when you look at the chat today, there's a, there have been debates, there have been take-home messages, everything there in the chat. It's been really active. So um, uh, I think everyone's really enjoyed. And looking also at the participation, they've stuck throughout the session, which is absolutely wonderful. And kudos to all of you uh, who've uh, really glued the participants to their screens today. And um, thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great. Uh, how, do, how do we give audience. Keshav? How do we give Keshav a pat on the back? Hard <laughs> to do digitally. Huh? Yeah. But you did a good job, Keshav. Thank you I so much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fantastic Thanks. job, Dr. Keshav. Thank you so much, everyone, and looking forward to all the other events that are coming up. Great. So, on great. behalf of Shivani, we thank you, the moderator, and all the speakers and all the participants. 
and we will uh, come back with similar uh, you know events and webinars in time to come thank you very much we will end this session with our corporate video awesome it begins with a single step and that step was first taken in 1971 when the founder late mr chandrakant m modi started his first trading company ketan and company for scientific instruments and laboratory equipment but before i go down memory lane let me thank you for being here and watching this video hello i am ashish modi cso chief success officer and medical inventor at shivani scientific where we enable and support ivf centers and clinic to impart successful assisted reproductive treatment by providing turnkey projects innovative equipment services and timely end to end solutions 2021 marks the golden jubilee year of shivani yes 50 years of leadership and innovation marked by setting up of 1000 plus ivf centers in india and across the globe in 30 plus countries let me take you down memory lane and joining us would be a few dear friends and well wishers who like you have been integral part of this beautiful journey when i started the ivf program way back in 1985 we used to prepare our own culture medium we very wisely and aptly decided to import the ready made culture media for ivf now this was a great success because it solved lot of our problems now this initial success led to shivani scientific in venturing into more and more of ivf products and supply all the equipments required for ivf laboratory including setting up I started the IVF journey in Nigeria in 2007 and Shivani has played a very big role in the success of our unit. Our first equipment and the training and all that went into it. I don't know what we could have done to have achieved over 2000 IVF babies over the years. years experience in laboratory technology and yeah for now already active in ART since 1994 so almost 30 years of service to the IVF community what she wanted to evolve over the years from a local player uh, in the Indian market to a company that is now uh, active globally
still remember 2003 when I first came to your Dahisar plant, saw your innovation. At that time, you used to make spermifuge, you used to make heating blocks, which nobody made in the country. You don't only support us, you are a part of us. That you want to make a difference and you really want to serve through us the infertile couple. That the only thing which matters is fertility champions and you are a part of the whole team across the country. This journey of co-creating IVF success has been possible because of your support and confidence. So a heartful thank you from myself and entire team at Shivani Scientific. And here is a commitment to innovation, quality products and great service so that we can continue co-creating IVF success with you for years to come.